Section 1 of Fantasy, Fairies, and Ghosts. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra. Fantasy, Fairies, and Ghosts by Various. Section 1. Cross Purposes. Chapter 1. Once upon a time, the Queen of Fairyland, finding her own subjects far too well behaved to be amusing, took a sudden longing to have a mortal or two at her court. So after looking about her for some time, she fixed upon two to bring to Fairyland. But how were they to be brought? Please, Your Majesty, said at last the daughter of the Prime Minister, I will bring the girl. The speaker, whose name was Peas Blossom, after her great-great-grandmother, looked so graceful and hung her head so apologetically that the Queen said at once, How will you manage it, Peas Blossom? I will open the road before her and close it behind her. I have heard that you have pretty ways of doing things, so you may try. The court happened to be held in an open forest glade of smooth turf, upon which there was just one mole heap. As soon as the queen had given her permission to Peas Blossom, up through the mole heap came the head of a goblin, which cried out, Please, your majesty, I will bring the boy. You, exclaimed the queen, how will you do it? The goblin began to wriggle himself out of the earth, as if he had been a snake, and the whole world his skin, till the court was convulsed with laughter. As soon as he got free, he began to roll over and over in every possible manner, rotatory and cylindrical, all at once, until he reached the wood. The courtiers followed, holding their sides, so that the queen was left sitting upon her throne in solitary state. When they reached the wood, the goblin, whose name was Toadstool, was nowhere to be seen. While they were looking for him, out popped his head from the mole heap again, with the words, So, your majesty? You have taken your own time to answer, said the queen, laughing. And my own way too, eh, your majesty, rejoined Toadstool, grinning. No doubt. Well, you may try and the goblin making as much of a bow as he could with only half his neck above ground, disappeared under it. End of section one. See Fairies and Ghosts by Various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Cross Purposes, Chapter Two. No mortal, or fairy either, can tell where fairyland begins and where it ends. But somewhere on the borders of fairyland there was a nice country village, in which lived some nice country people. Alice was the daughter of the squire, a pretty good-natured girl, whom her friends called fairy-like and others called silly. One rosy summer evening, when the wall opposite her bed was flaked all over with rosiness, she threw herself down on her bed and lay gazing at the wall. The rose colour sank through her eyes and dyed her brain, and she began to feel as if she were reading a storybook. She thought she was looking at a western sea, with the waves all red with sunset. But when the colour died out, Alice gave a sigh to see how commonplace the wall grew. I wish it was always sunset, she said, half aloud. I don't like grey things. I will take you where the sun is always setting, if you like, Alice, said a sweet, tiny voice near her. She looked down on the coverlet of the bed, and there, looking up at her, stood a lovely little creature. It seemed quite natural that the little lady should be there, for many things we never could believe have only to happen, and then there is nothing strange about them. She was dressed in white, with a cloak of sunset red, the colours of the sweetest of sweet peas. 
On her head was a crown of twisted tendrils, with a little gold beetle in front. Are you a fairy? said Alice. Yes. Will you go with me to the sunset? Yes, I will. When Alice proceeded to rise, she found that she was no bigger than the fairy, and when she stood up on the counterpane, the bed looked like a great hall with a painted ceiling. As she walked towards Peas Blossom, she stumbled several times over the tufts that made the pattern, but the fairy took her by the hand and led her towards the foot of the bed. Long before they reached it, however, Alice saw that the fairy was a tall, slender lady, and that she herself was quite her own size. What she had taken for tufts on the counterpane were really bushes of firs and broom and heather on the side of a slope. "'Where are we?' asked Alice. "'Going on,' answered the fairy. Alice, not liking the reply, said, "'I want to go home.' "'Goodbye, then.' answered the fairy. Alice looked round. A wide hilly country lay all about them. She could not even tell from what quarter they had come. I must go with you, I see, she said. Before they reached the bottom, they were walking over the loveliest meadow grass. A little stream went cantering down beside them, without channel or bank, sometimes running between the blades sometimes sweeping the grass all one way under it. And it made a great babbling for such a little stream and such a smooth course. Gradually the slope grew gentler, and the stream flowed more softly and spread out wider. At length they came to a wood of long straight poplars growing out of the water, for the stream ran into the wood and there stretched out into a lake. Alice thought they could go no further, but Peas Blossom led her straight on, and they walked through. It was now dark, but everything under the water gave out a pale, quiet light. There were deep pools here and there, but there was no mud, or frogs, or water lizards, or eels. All the bottom was pure, lovely grass, brilliantly green, down the banks of the pools she saw, all under water, primroses and violets and pimpernels. Any flower she wished to see, she had only to look for, and she was sure to find it. When a pool came in their way, the fairy swam, and Alice swam by her, and when they got out they were quite dry, though the water was as delightfully wet as water should be. Besides the trees, Tall, splendid lilies grew out of it, and hollyhocks and irises and sword plants, and many other long-stemmed flowers. From every leaf and petal of these, from every branch tip and tendril, dropped bright water. It gathered slowly at each point, but the points were so many that there was a constant musical plashing of diamond rain upon the still surface of the lake. As they went on, the moon rose and threw a pale mist of light over the hole, and the diamond drops turned to half-liquid pearls, and round every treetop was a halo of moonlight, and the water went to sleep, and the flowers began to dream. Look, said the fairy, those lilies are just dreaming themselves into a child's sleep. I can see them smiling. This is the place out of which go the things that appear to children every night. Is this dreamland, then? asked Alice. If you like, answered the fairy. How far am I from home? The farther you go, the nearer home you are. Then the fairy lady gathered a bundle of poppies and gave it to Alice. The next deep pool that they came to, she told her to throw it in. Alice did so, and following it, laid her head upon it. That moment she began to sink. Down and down she went, till at last she felt herself lying on the long, thick grass at the bottom of the pool, with the poppies under her head and the clear water high over it. Up through it she saw the moon, whose bright face looked sleepy too. 
disturbed only by the little ripples of the rain from the tall flowers on the edges of the pool. She fell fast asleep, and all night dreamed about home. End of chapter 2 See Fairies and Ghosts by Various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Cross Purposes, Chapter 3. Richard, which is name enough for a fairy story, was the son of a widow in Alice's village. He was so poor that he did not find himself generally welcome, so he hardly went anywhere, but read books at home and waited upon his mother. His manners, therefore, were shy and sufficiently awkward to give an unfavourable impression to those who looked at outsides. Alice would have despised him, but he never came near enough for that. Now Richard had been saving up his few pence in order to buy an umbrella for his mother, for the winter would come, and the one she had was almost torn to ribbons. One bright summer evening, when he thought umbrellas must be cheap, he was walking across the marketplace to buy one. There, in the middle of it, stood an odd-looking little man, actually selling umbrellas. Here was a chance for him. When he drew nearer, he found that the little man, while vaunting his umbrellas to the skies, was asking such absurdly small prices for them that no one would venture to buy one. He had opened and laid them all out at full stretch on the marketplace. About five and twenty of them stick downwards like little tents, and he stood beside haranguing the people. But he would not allow one of the crowd to touch his umbrellas. As soon as his eye fell upon Richard, he changed his tone and said, Well, as nobody seems inclined to buy, I think, my dear umbrellas, we had better be going home. Whereupon the umbrellas got up, with some difficulty, and began hobbling away. The people stared at each other with open mouths, for they saw that what they had taken for a lot of umbrellas was in reality a flock of black geese. A great turkey cock went gobbling behind them, driving them all down a lane towards the forest. Richard thought with himself, There is more in this than I can account for, but an umbrella that could lay eggs would be a very jolly umbrella. So by the time the people were beginning to laugh at each other, Richard was halfway down the lanes at the heels of the geese. There he stooped and caught one of them, but instead of a goose, he had a huge hedgehog in his hands, which he dropped in dismay. Whereupon it waddled away, a goose as before, and the whole of them began cackling and hissing in a way that he could not mistake. For the turkey cock he gobbled and gabbled and choked himself and got right again in the most ridiculous manner. In fact, he seemed sometimes to forget that he was a turkey and laughed like a fool. All at once, with a simultaneous long-necked hiss, they flew into the wood and the turkey after them. But Richard soon got up with them again, and found them all hanging by their feet from the trees, in two rows, one on each side of the path, while the turkey was walking on. Him Richard followed, but the moment he reached the middle of the suspended geese, from every side arose the most frightful hisses, and their necks grew longer and longer, till there were nearly thirty broad bills close to his head, blowing in his face, in his ears, and at the back of his neck. But the turkey, looking round, and seeing what was going on, turned and walked back. When he reached the place, he looked up at the first and gobbled at him in the wildest manner. That goose grew silent and dropped from the tree. Then he went to the next and the next and so on, till he had gobbled them all off the trees, one after another, but when Richard expected to see them go after the turkey, there was nothing there but a flock of huge mushrooms and puffballs. I have had enough of this, thought Richard. I will go home again. 
Go home, Richard, said a voice close to him. Looking down, he saw, instead of the turkey, the most comical-looking little man he had ever seen. Go home, Master Richard, repeated he, grinning. Not for your bidding, answered Richard. Come on, then, Master Richard. Nor that either, without a good reason. I will give you such an umbrella for your mother. I don't take presents from strangers. Bless you! I'm no stranger here. Oh, no, not at all. And he set off in the manner usual with him, rolling every way at once. Richard could not help laughing and following. At length, Toadstool plumped into a great hole full of water. Served him right, thought Richard. Served him right, bawled the goblin, crawling out again and shaking the water from him like a spaniel. This is the very place I wanted, only I rolled too fast. However, he went on rolling again faster than before, though it was now uphill, till he came to the top of a considerable height, on which grew a number of palm trees. Have you a knife, Richard? said the goblin, stopping all at once as if he had been walking quietly along, just like other people. Richard pulled out a pocket-knife and gave it to the creature, who instantly cut a deep gash in one of the trees. Then he bounded to another and did the same, and so on till he had gashed them all. Richard, following him, saw that a little stream, clearer than the clearest water, began to flow from each increasing in size the longer it flowed. Before he had reached the last, there was quite a tinkling and rustling of the little rills that ran down the stems of the palms. This grew and grew, till Richard saw that a full rivulet was flowing down the side of the hill. Here is your knife, Richard, said the goblin, but by the time he had put it in his pocket, the rivulet had grown to a small torrent. Now, Richard, come along, said Toadstool, and threw himself into the torrent. I would rather have a boat, returned Richard. Oh, you stupid, cried Toadstool, crawling up the side of the hill, down which the stream had already carried him some distance. With every contortion that labour and difficulty could suggest, yet with incredible rapidity, he crawled to the very top of one of the trees, and tore down a huge leaf which he threw on the ground, and himself after it, rebounding like a ball. He then laid the leaf on the water, held it by the stem, and told Richard to get upon it. He did so. It went down deep in the middle with his weight. Toadstool let it go, and it shot down the stream like an arrow. This began the strangest and most delightful voyage. The stream rushed careering and curveting down the hillside, bright as a diamond, and soon reached a meadow plain. The goblin rolled alongside of the boat like a bundle of weeds, but Richard rode in triumph through the low grassy country upon the back of his watery steed. It went straight as an arrow, and, strange to tell, was heaped up on the ground, like a ridge of water or a wave only rushing on endways. It needed no channel, and turned aside for no opposition. It flowed over everything that crossed its path, like a great serpent of water, with folds fitting into all the ups and downs of the way. If a wall came in its course, it flowed against it, heaping itself up on itself till it reached the top, whence it plunged to the foot of the other side, and flowed on. Soon he found that it was running gently up a grassy hill. The waves kept curling back as if the wind blew them, or as if they could hardly keep from running down again. But still the stream mounted and flowed, and the waves with it. It found it difficult, but it could do it. When they reached the top, it bore them across a heathy country, rolling over purple heather and blue harebells, and delicate ferns, and tall foxgloves crowded with bells, purple and white. 
All the time the palm leaf curled its edges away from the water, and made a delightful boat for Richard, while Toadstool tumbled along in the stream like a porpoise. At length the water began to run very fast, and went faster and faster, till suddenly it plunged them into a deep lake with a great splash, and stopped there. Toadstool went out of sight, and came up gasping and grinning, while Richard's boat tossed and heaved like a vessel in a storm at sea, but not a drop of water came in. Then the goblin began to swim, and pushed and tugged the boat along, but the lake was so still, and the motion so pleasant, that Richard fell fast asleep. End of section 3「Fantasy Fairies and Ghosts by Various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Cross Purposes, Chapter 4 When he woke he found himself still afloat upon the broad palm leaf. He was alone in the middle of a lake, with flowers and trees growing in and out of it everywhere. The sun was just over the treetops. A drip of water from the flowers greeted him with music. The mists were dissolving away, and where the sunlight fell on the lake, the water was clear as glass. Casting his eyes downward, he saw, just beneath him, far down at the bottom, Alice drowned, as he thought. He was in the act of plunging in when he saw her eyes open, and at the same moment begin to float up. He held out his hand, but she repelled it with disdain, and swimming to a tree sat down on a low branch, wondering how ever the poor widow's son could have found his way into fairyland. She did not like it. It was an invasion of privilege. "'How did you come here, young Richard?' she asked from six yards off. "'A goblin brought me.' "'Ah, I thought so. A fairy brought me.' Where is your fairy? Here I am, said Peas Blossom, rising slowly to the surface, just by the tree on which Alice was seated. Where is your goblin? retorted Alice. Here I am, bawled Toadstool, rushing out of the water like a salmon, and casting a somersault in the air before he fell in again with a tremendous splash. His head rose again close beside Peas Blossom, who, being used to such creatures, only laughed. "'Isn't he handsome?' he grinned. "'Yes, very. He wants polishing, though. You could do that for yourself, you know. Shall we change?' "'I don't mind. You'll find her rather silly.' "'That's nothing. The boy's too sensible for me.' He dived and rose at Alice's feet. She shrieked with terror. The fairy floated away like a water lily towards Richard. What a lovely creature, thought he. But hearing Alice shriek again, he said, Don't leave Alice. She's frightened at that queer creature. I don't think there's any harm in him, though, Alice. Oh, no, he won't hurt her, said Peace Blossom. I'm tired of her. He's going to take her to the court, and I will take you. I don't want to go. But you must. You can't go home again. You don't know the way. Richard, Richard, cried Alice in an agony. Richard sprang from his boat and was by her side in a moment. He pinched me, cried Alice. Richard hit the goblin a terrible blow on the head, but it took no more effect upon him than if his head had been a round ball of India rubber. He gave Richard a furious look, however, and bawling out, You'll repent that dick, vanished under the water. Come along, Richard, make haste. He will murder you, cried the fairy. It's all your fault, said Richard. I won't leave Alice. Then the fairy saw it was all over with her and Toadstool, for they can do nothing with mortals against their will. So she floated away across the water in Richard's boat, holding her robe for a sail, and vanished, leaving the two alone in the lake. 
you have driven away my fairy cried alice i shall never get home now it is all your fault you naughty young man i drove away the goblin remonstrated richard will you please to sit on the other side of the tree i wonder what my papa would say if he saw me talking to you will you come to the next tree alice said richard after a pause alice who had been crying all the time that richard was thinking said i won't richard therefore plunged into the water without her and swam for the tree before he had got half way however he heard alice crying richard richard this was just what he wanted so he turned back and alice threw herself into the water with richard's help she swam pretty well and they reached the tree now for the next said richard and they swam to the next and then to the third every tree they reached was larger than the last and every tree before them was larger still so they swam from tree to tree till they came to one that was so large that they could not see round it what was to be done clearly to climb this tree it was a dreadful prospect for alice but richard proceeded to climb and by putting her feet where he put his and now and then getting hold of his ankle she managed to make her way up there were a great many stumps where branches had withered off and the bark was nearly as rough as a hillside so there was plenty of foothold for them when they had climbed a long time and were getting very tired indeed alice cried out richard i shall drop i shall why did you come this way and she began once more to cry but at that moment richard caught hold of a branch above his head and reaching down his other hand got hold of alice and held her till she had recovered a little in a few moments more they reached the fork of the tree and there they sat and rested this is capital said richard cheerily what is asked alice sulkily why we have room to rest and there's no hurry for a minute or two i'm tired you selfish creature said alice if you are tired what must i be tired too answered richard but we've got on bravely and look what's that by this time the day was gone and the night so near that in the shadows of the tree all was dusky and dim but there was still light enough to discover that in a niche of the tree sat a huge horned owl with green spectacles on his beak and a book in one foot he took no heed of the intruders but kept muttering to himself and what do you think the owl was saying i will tell you he was talking about the book that he held upside down in his foot stupid book this nothing in it at all everything upside down stupid ass says owls can't read i can read backwards i think that is the goblin again said richard in a whisper however if you ask a plain question he must give you a plain answer for they are not allowed to tell downright lies in fairyland don't ask him richard you know you gave him a dreadful blow i gave him what he deserved and he owes me the same hello which is the way out he wouldn't say if you please because then it would not have been a plain question downstairs hissed the owl without ever lifting his eyes from the book which all the time he read upside down so learned was he on your honour as a respectable old owl asked richard no hissed the owl and richard was almost sure that he was not really an owl so he stood staring at him for a few moments when all at once without lifting his eyes from the book the owl said i will sing a song and began nobody knows the world but me when they're all in bed i sit up to see i'm a better student than students all for i never read till the darkness fall 
and I never read without my glasses, and that is how my wisdom passes. Howl, owl, wool, hool, wool, wool. I can see the wind. Now who can do that? I see the dreams that he has in his hat. I see him snorting them out as he goes, out at his stupid old trumpet nose. Ten thousand things that you couldn't think, I write them down with pen and ink. Howl, owl, hoo, loo, wit, tit, tit, that's wit. You may call it learning, tis mother wit. No one else sees the lady moon sit on the sea, her nest all night but the owl hatching the boats and the long-legged fowl. When the oysters gape to sing by rote, she crams a pearl down each stupid throat. Howl, owl, wit, it, that's wit, there's a fowl. And so singing, he threw the book in Richard's face, spread out his great silent soft wings, and sped away into the depths of the tree. When the book struck Richard, he found that it was only a lump of wet moss. While talking to the owl, he had spied a hollow behind one of the branches. Judging this to be the way the owl meant, he went to see, and found a rude, ill-defined staircase going down into the very heart of the trunk. But so large was the tree that this could not have hurt it in the least. Down this stair, then, Richard scrambled as best he could, followed by Alice, not of her own will. She gave him clearly to understand, but because she could do no better. Down, down they went, slipping and falling sometimes, but never very far, because the stair went round and round. It caught Richard when he slipped, and he caught Alice when she did. They had begun to fear that there was no end to the stair, it went round and round so steadily, when creeping through a crack, they found themselves in a great hall, supported by thousands of pillars of grey stone. Where the little light came from they could not tell. This hall they began to cross in a straight line, hoping to reach one side, and intending to walk along it till they came to some opening. They kept straight by going from pillar to pillar, as they had done before by the trees. Any honest plan will do in fairyland, if you only stick to it, and no plan will do if you do not stick to it. It was very silent, and Alice disliked the silence more than the dimness, so much indeed that she longed to hear Richard's voice but she had always been so cross to him when he had spoken that he thought it better to let her speak first, and she was too proud to do that. She would not even let him walk alongside of her, but always went slower when he wanted to wait for her, so that at last he strode on alone, and Alice followed. But by degrees the horror of silence grew upon her, and she felt at last as if there were no one in the universe but herself. The hall went on widening around her, their footsteps made no noise, the silence grew so intense that it seemed on the point of taking shape. At last she could bear it no longer. She ran after Richard, got up with him and laid hold of his arm. He had been thinking for some time what an obstinate, disagreeable girl Alice was, and wishing he had her safe home to be rid of her, when feeling a hand and looking round, he saw that it was the disagreeable girl. She soon began to be companionable after a fashion, for she began to think, putting everything together, that Richard must have been several times in Fairyland before now. It is very strange, she said to herself, for he is quite a poor boy. I am sure of that. His arms stick out beyond his jacket like the ribs of his mother's umbrella. And to think of me wandering about fairyland with him. The moment she touched his arm, they saw an arch of blackness before them. They had walked straight to a door. Not a very inviting one, for it opened upon an utterly dark passage. 
Where there was only one door, however, there was no difficulty about choosing. Richard walked straight through it, and from the greater fear of being left behind, Alice faced the lesser fear of going on. In a moment they were in total darkness. Alice clung to Richard's arm and murmured almost against her will, Dear Richard! It was strange that fear should speak like love, but it was in fairyland. It was strange, too, that as soon as she spoke thus, Richard should fall in love with her all at once. But what was more curious still was that, at the same moment, Richard saw her face. In spite of her fear, which had made her pale, she looked very lovely. Dear Alice, said Richard, how pale you look. How can you tell that, Richard, when all is as black as pitch? I can see your face. It gives out light. Now I see your hands. Now I can see your feet. Yes, I can see every spot where you are going to. No, don't put your foot there. There is an ugly toad just there. The fact was that the moment he began to love Alice, his eyes began to send forth light. What he thought came from Alice's face really came from his eyes. All about her and her path he could see, and every minute saw better. But to his own path he was blind. He could not see his hand when he held it straight before his face, so dark was it. But he could see Alice, and that was better than seeing the way, ever so much. At length, Alice too began to see a face dawning through the darkness. It was Richard's face, but it was far handsomer than when she saw it last. Her eyes had begun to give light too, and she said to herself, Can it be that I love the poor widow's son? I suppose that must be it, she answered herself with a smile, for she was not disgusted with herself at all. Richard saw the smile and was glad. Her paleness had gone, and a sweet rosiness had taken its place, and now she saw Richard's path as he saw hers, and between the two sights they got on well. They were now walking on a path betwixt two deep waters which never moved, shining as black as ebony where the eyelight fell but they saw ere long that this path kept growing narrower and narrower. At last, to Alice's dismay, the black waters met in front of them. What is to be done now, Richard? she said. When they fixed their eyes on the water before them, they saw that it was swarming with lizards and frogs and black snakes and all kinds of strange and ugly creatures especially some that had neither heads nor tails, nor legs nor fins nor feelers, being, in fact, only living lumps. These kept jumping out and in and sprawling upon the path. Richard thought for a few moments before replying to Alice's question, as indeed well he might, but he came to the conclusion that the path could not have gone on for the sake of stopping there, and that it must be a kind of finger that pointed on where it was not allowed to go itself. So he caught up Alice in his strong arms and jumped into the middle of the horrid swarm. And just as minnows vanish if you throw anything amongst them, just so these wretched creatures vanished, right and left and every way. He found the water broader than he had expected, and before he got over, he found Alice heavier than he could have believed. But upon a firm, rocky bottom, Richard waded through in safety. When he reached the other side, he found that the bank was a lofty, smooth, perpendicular rock, with some rough steps cut in it. By and by the steps led them right into the rock, and they were in a narrow passage once more, but this time leading up. It wound round and round like the thread of a great screw. At last Richard knocked his head against something and could go no further. The place was close and hot. 
He put up his hands and pushed what felt like a warm stone. It moved a little. Go down, you brutes, growled a voice above, quivering with anger. You'll upset my pot and my cat and my temper too if you push that way. Go down. Richard knocked very gently and said, Please let us out. Oh, yes, I dare say. Very fine and soft-spoken. Go down, you goblin brutes. I've had enough of you. I'll scald the hair off your ugly heads. If you do that again, go down, I say. Seeing fair speech was of no avail, Richard told Alice to go down a little, out of the way, and setting his shoulders to one end of the stone, heaved it up. Whereupon down came the other end, with a pot and a fire, and a cat which had been asleep beside it. She frightened Alice dreadfully as she rushed past her, showing nothing but her green lamping eyes. Richard, peeping up, found that he had turned a hearthstone upside down. On the edge of the hole stood a little crooked old man, brandishing a mop-stick in a tremendous rage, and hesitating only where to strike him. But Richard put him out of his difficulty by springing up and taking the stick from him. Then, having lifted Alice out, he returned it with a bow, and heedless of the maledictions of the old man, proceeded to get the stone and the pot up again. For Puss, she got out herself. Then the old man became a little more friendly and said, I beg your pardon, I thought you were goblins. They never will let me alone, but you must allow it was rather an unusual way of paying a morning call, and the creature bowed conciliatingly. It was indeed, answered Richard. I wish you had turned the door to us instead of the hearthstone, for he did not trust the old man. But, he added, I hope you will forgive us. Oh, certainly, certainly, my dear young people, use your freedom but such young people have no business to be out alone. It is against the rules. But what is one to do? I mean two to do when they can't help it. Yes, yes, of course, but now you know I must take charge of you. So you sit there, young gentleman, and you sit there, young lady. He put a chair for one at one side of the hearth and for the other at the other side and then drew his chair between them. The cat got upon his hump and then set up her own. So here was a wall that would let through no moonshine. But although both Richard and Alice were very much amused, they did not like to be parted in this peremptory manner. Still, they thought it better not to anger the old man any more, in his own house too. But he had been once angered, and that was once too often, for he had made it a rule never to forgive without taking it out in humiliation. It was so disagreeable to have him sitting there between them that they felt as if they were far asunder. In order to get the better of the fancy, they wanted to hold each other's hand behind the dwarf's back. But the moment their hands began to approach, the back of the cat began to grow long and its hump to grow high and in a moment more Richard found himself crawling wearily up a steep hill, whose ridge rose against the stars, while a cold wind blew drearily over it. Not a habitation was in sight, and Alice had vanished from his eyes. He felt, however, that she must be somewhere on the other side, and so climbed and climbed to get over the brow of the hill, and down to where he thought she must be but the longer he climbed, the farther off the top of the hill seemed, till at last he sank, quite exhausted, and, must I confess it, very nearly began to cry. To think of being separated from Alice all at once, and in such a disagreeable way. But he fell a-thinking instead, and soon said to himself, This must be some trick of that wretched old man. Either this mountain is a cat, or it is not. If it is a mountain, this won't hurt it. If it is a cat, I hope it will. With that, 
he pulled out his pocket knife and feeling for a soft place drove it at one blow up to the handle in the side of the mountain a terrific shriek was the first result and the second that alice and he sat looking at each other across the old man's hump from which the catamountain had vanished their host sat staring at the blank fireplace without ever turning round pretending to know nothing of what had taken place come along alice said richard rising this won't do we won't stop here alice rose at once and put her hand in his they walked towards the door the old man took no notice of them the moon was shining brightly through the window but instead of stepping out into the moonlight when they opened the door they stepped into a great beautiful hall through the high gothic windows of which the same moon was shining out of this hall they could find no way except by a staircase of stone which led upwards they ascended it together at the top alice let go richard's hand to peep into a little room which looked all the colours of the rainbow just like the inside of a diamond richard went a step or two along a corridor but finding she had left him turned and looked into the chamber he could see her nowhere the room was full of doors and she must have mistaken the door he heard her voice calling him and hurried in direction of the sound but he could see nothing of her more tricks he said to himself it is of no use to stab this one i must wait till i see what can be done still he heard alice calling him and still he followed as well as he could at length he came to a doorway open to the air through which the moonlight fell but when he reached it he found that it was high up in the side of a tower the wall of which went straight down from his feet without stair or descent of any kind. Again he heard Alice call him, and lifting his eyes saw her across a wide castle court, standing at another door just like the one he was at, with the moon shining full upon her. All right, Alice, he cried. Can you hear me? Yes, answered she. Then listen, this is all a trick. It is all a lie of that old wretch in the kitchen. Just reach out your hand, Alice, dear. Alice did as Richard asked her, and although they saw each other many yards off across the court, their hands met. There, I thought so, exclaimed Richard triumphantly. Now, Alice, I don't believe it is more than a foot or two down to the court below, though it looks like a hundred feet. Keep fast hold of my hand and jump when I count three. But Alice drew her hand from him in sudden dismay, whereupon Richard said, Well, I will try first, and jumped. The same moment his cheery laugh came to Alice's ears, and she saw him standing safe on the ground far below. Jump, dear Alice, and I will catch you, said he. I can't. I am afraid, answered she. The old man is somewhere near you. You had better jump said Richard. Alice sprang from the wall in terror and only fell a foot or two into Richard's arms. The moment she touched the ground they found themselves outside the door of a little cottage which they knew very well. For it was only just within the wood that bordered on their village. Hand in hand they ran home as fast as they could. When they reached a little gate that led into her father's grounds Richard bade Alice good-bye. The tears came in her eyes. Richard and she seemed to have grown quite man and woman in fairyland, and they did not want to part now. But they felt that they must. So Alice ran in the back way and reached her own room before anyone had missed her. Indeed, the last of the red had not quite faded from the west. As Richard crossed the marketplace on his way home, he saw an umbrella man just selling the last of his umbrellas. He thought the man gave him a queer look as he passed, and felt very much inclined to punch his head. 
but remembering how useless it had been to punch the goblin's head, he thought it better not. In reward of their courage, the fairy queen sent them permission to visit fairyland as often as they pleased, and no goblin or fairy was allowed to interfere with them. For Peas Blossom and Toadstool, they were both banished from court and compelled to live together for seven years in an old tree that had just one green leaf upon it. Toadstool did not mind it much, but Peas Blossom did. End of section four. End of cross purposes. Five of Fantasy Fairies and Ghosts. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra. Fantasy, Fairies and Ghosts by Various. Section 5. The Carasoin. Chapter 1. The Mountain Stream. Once upon a time there lived in a valley in Scotland a boy about twelve years of age, the son of a shepherd. His mother was dead and he had no sister or brother. His father was out all day on the hills with his sheep, but when he came home at night he was as sure of finding the cottage neat and clean, the floor swept, a bright fire and his supper waiting for him as if he had had a wife and daughter to look after his household, instead of only a boy. Therefore, although Colin could only read and write, he knew nothing of figures. He was ten times wiser and more capable of learning anything than if he had been at school all his days. He was never at a loss when anything had to be done. Somehow he always blundered into the straight road to his end, while another would be putting on his shoes to look for it. And yet all the time that he was busiest working, he was busiest building castles in the air. I think the two ought always to go together. And so Colin was never overworked, but had plenty of time to himself. In winter he spent it in reading by the fireside, or carving pieces of wood with his pocket knife, and in summer he always went out for a ramble. His great delight was in a little stream which ran down the valley from the mountains above. Up this burn he would wander every afternoon with his hands in his pockets. He never got far, however he was so absorbed in watching its antics. Sometimes he would sit on a rock, staring at the water, as it hurried through the stones, scolding, expostulating, muttering, and always having its own way. Sometimes he would stop by a deep pool and watch the crimson-spotted trouts darting about as if their thoughts and not their tails sent them where they wanted to go. And when he stopped at the little cascade, tumbling smooth and shining over a hollowed rock, he seldom got beyond it. But there was one thing which always troubled him. It was that when the stream came near the cottage, it could find no other way than through the little yard where stood the cowhouse and the pigsty, and there, not finding a suitable channel, spread abroad in a disconsolate manner, becoming rather a puddle than a brook, all defiled with the treading of the cloven feet of the cow and the pigs. In fact, it looked quite lost and ruined, so that even after it had, with much labour, got out of the yard again, it took a long time to gather itself together, and not quite succeeding, slipped away as if ashamed, with spent forces and poverty-stricken speed, till at length, meeting the friendly help of a rivulet coming straight from the hills, it gathered heart and bounded on afresh. It can't be all that the cow drinks that makes the difference, said Colin to himself. The pigs don't care about it. I do believe it's affronted at being dashed about. The cow isn't dirty, but she's rather stupid and inconsiderate. The pigs are dirty, 
Something must be done. Let me see. He reconnoitred the whole ground. Upon the other side of the house all was rock, through which he could not cut, and he was forced to the conclusion that the only other course for the stream to take lay right through the cottage. To most engineers this would have appeared the one course to be avoided, but Colin's heart danced at the thought of having his dear burn running right through the house. How cool it would be all the summer, how convenient for cooking, and how handy at meals, and then the music of it. How it would tell him stories and sing him to sleep at night. What a companion it would be when his father was away, and then he could bathe in it when he liked. In winter, ah, to be sure, but winter was a long way off. The very next day his father went to the fair, so Colin set to work at once. It was not such a very difficult undertaking, for the walls of the cottage, and the floor as well, were of clay, the former nearly sun-dried into a brick, and the latter trampled hard, but still both assailable by pickaxe and spade. He cut through the walls and dug a channel along the floor, letting in stones in the bottom and sides. After it got out of the cottage and through the small garden in front, it should find its own way to the channel below, for here the hill was very steep. The same evening his father came home. "'What have you been about, Colin?' he asked in great surprise, when he saw the trench in the floor. "'Wait a minute, father,' said Colin, "'till I have got your supper, and then I'll tell you.' So when his father was seated at the table, Colin darted out, and hurrying up to the stream, broke through the bank just in the place whence a natural hollow led straight to the cottage. The stream dashed out like a wild creature from a cage, faster than he could follow, and shot through the wall of the cottage. His father gave a shout, and when Colin went in, he found him sitting with his spoon halfway to his mouth, and his eyes fixed on the muddy water which rushed foaming through his floor. "'It will soon be clean, father,' said Colin, "'and then it will be so nice.' His father made no answer, but continued staring. Colin went on with a long list of the advantages of having a brook running through your house. At length his father smiled and said, "'You are a curious creature, Colin, "'but why shouldn't you have your fancies as well as older people? "'We'll try it a while, and then we'll see about it.' "'The fact was, Colin's father had often thought "'what a lonely life the boy's was, "'and it seemed hard to take from him any pleasure he could have. "'So out rushed Colin at the front.' to see how the brook would take the shortest way headlong down the hill to its old channel. And to see it go tumbling down that hill was a sight worth living for. It is a mercy, said Colin. It has no neck to break, or it would break twenty times in a minute. It flings itself from rock to rock right down, just as I should like to do if it weren't for my neck. All that evening he was out and in without a moment's rest, now up to the beginning of the cut, now following the stream down to the cottage, then through the cottage and out again at the front door to see it dart across the garden and dash itself down the hill. At length his father told him he must go to bed. He took one more peep at the water, which was running quite clear now, and obeyed. His father followed him presently. End of section 5《To See Fairies and Ghosts by Various》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Carasoin, Chapter 2 The Fairy Fleet The bed was about a couple of yards from the edge of the brook, and as Colin was always first up in the morning, he slept at the front of the bed. 
So he lay for some time, gazing at the faint glimmer of the water in the dull red light from the sod-covered fire, and listening to its sweet music as it hurried through to the night again, till its murmur changed into a lullaby and sung him fast asleep. Soon he found that he was coming awake again. He was lying listening to the sound of the busy stream, but it had gathered more sounds since he went to sleep amongst the rest, one of the boards knocking together, and a tiny chattering and sweet laughter, like the tinkling of heather bells. He opened his eyes. The moon was shining along the brook, lighting the smoky rafters above with its reflection from the water, which had been dammed back at its outlet from the cottage, so that it lay bank full and level with the floor but its surface was hardly to be seen, save by an occasional glimmer, for the crowded boats of a fairy fleet which had just arrived. The sailors were as busy as sailors could be, mooring along the banks or running their boats high and dry on the shore. Some had little sails which glimmered white in the moonshine, half lowered, or blowing out in the light breeze that crept down the course of the stream. Some were pulling about through the rest, oars flashing, tiny voices calling, tiny feet running, tiny hands hauling at ropes that ran through blocks of shining ivory. On the shore stood groups of fairy ladies in all colours of the rainbow, green predominating, waited upon by gentlemen all in green, but with red and yellow feathers in their caps. The Queen had landed on the side next to Colin, and in a few minutes twenty dances were going at once along the shores of the fairy river, and there lay great Colin's face, just above the bedclothes, glowering at them like an ogre. At last, after a few dances, he heard a clear, sweet, ringing voice say, I've had enough of this. I'm tired of doing like the big people. Let's have a game of hay cock jig. That instant every group sprang asunder, and every fairy began a frolic on his own account. They scattered all over the cottage, and Colin lost sight of most of them. While he lay watching the antics of two of those near him, who behaved more like clowns at a fair, than the gentlemen they had been a little while before. He heard a voice close to his ear, but though he looked everywhere about his pillow, he could see nothing. The voice stopped the moment he began to look, but began again as soon as he gave it up. You can't see me. I'm talking to you through a hole in the head of your bed. Don't look, said the voice. If the Queen sees me, I shall be pinched. Oh, please don't. The voice sounded as if its owner would cry presently, so Colin took great care not to look. It went on. Please, I am a little girl, not a fairy. The Queen stole me the minute I was born, seven years ago, and I can't get away. I don't like the fairies. They are so silly, and they never grow any wiser. I grow wiser every year. I want to get back to my own people. They won't let me. They make me play at being somebody else all night long and sleep all day. That's what they do themselves, and I should so like to be myself. The Queen says that's not the way to be happy at all, but I do want very much to be a little girl. Do take me. How am I to get you? asked Colin in a whisper, which sounded after the sweet voice of the changeling, like the wind in a field of dry beans. The Queen is so pleased with you that she is sure to offer you something. Choose me. Here she comes. Immediately he heard another voice, shriller and stronger, in front of him, and looking about, saw standing on the edge of the bed a lovely little creature with a crown glittering with jewels, and a rush for a sceptre in her hand, the blossom of which shone like a bunch of garnets. 
"'You great staring creature,' she said. "'Your eyes are much too big to see with. "'What clumsy hobgoblins you thick folk are!' "'So saying, she laid her wand across Colin's eyes. "'Now then, stupid,' she said, "'and that instant Colin saw the room like a huge barn, "'full of creatures about two feet high.' The beams overhead were crowded with fairies, playing all imaginable tricks, scrambling everywhere, knocking each other over, throwing dust and soot in each other's faces, grinning from behind corners, dropping on each other's necks and tripping up each other's heels. Two had got hold of an empty eggshell, and coming behind one sitting on the edge of the table and laughing at someone on the floor, tumbled it right over him, so that he was lost in the cavernous hollow. But the lady fairies mingled in none of these rough pranks. Their tricks were always graceful, and they had more to say than to do. But the moment the queen had laid her wand across his eyes, she went on. No, son of a human mortal, that thou hast pleased a queen of the fairies. Lady, as I am over the elements, I cannot have everything I desire, one thing thou hast given me. Years have I longed for a path down this rivulet to the ocean below. Your horrid farmyard, ever since your great-grandfather built this cottage, was the one obstacle. For we fairies hate dirt, not only in houses but in fields and woods as well, and above all in running streams. But I can't talk like this any longer. I tell you what. You are a dear good boy, and you shall have what you please. Ask me for anything you like. May it please your majesty, said Colin, very deliberately. I want a little girl that you carried away some seven years ago the moment she was born. May it please your majesty. I want her. It does not please my majesty, cried the queen, whose face had been growing very black. Ask for something else. Then whether it pleases your majesty or not, said Colin bravely, I hold your majesty to your word. I want that little girl, and that little girl I will have and nothing else. You dare to talk so to me, you thick? Yes, your majesty. Then you shan't have her. Then I'll turn the brook right through the dunghill, said Colin. Do you think I'll let you come into my cottage to play at hijinks when you please, if you behave to me like this? And Colin sat up in bed and looked the queen in the face. And as he did so, he caught sight of the loveliest little creature peeping round the corner at the foot of the bed. And he knew she was the little girl because she was quiet and looked frightened and was sucking her thumb. Then the queen, seeing with whom she had to deal and knowing that queens in fairyland are bound by their word, began to try another plan with him. She put on her sweetest manner and looks, and as she did so, the little face at the foot of the bed grew more troubled and the little head shook itself, and the little thumb dropped out of the little mouth. Dear Colin, said the Queen, you shall have the girl, but you must do something for me first. The little girl shook her head as fast as ever she could, but Colin was taken up with the Queen. To be sure I will, what is it, he said, and so he was bound by a new bargain and was in the Queen's power. You must fetch me a bottle of carasoin, said she. What is that? asked Colin. A kind of wine that makes people happy. Why, are you not happy already? No, Colin, answered the Queen with a sigh. You have everything you want, except the carasoin, returned the Queen. You do whatever you like, and go wherever you please. That's just it. 
I want something that I neither like nor please that I don't know anything about. I want a bottle of carasoin. And here she cried like a spoilt child, not like a sorrowful woman. But how am I to get it? I don't know. You must find out. Oh, that's not fair, cried Colin. But the queen burst into a fit of laughter that sounded like the bells of a hundred frolicking sheep, and bounding away to the side of the river, jumped on board of her boat, and like a swarm of bees gathered the courtiers and sailors. Two creeping out of the bellows, one at the nozzle and the other at the valve, three out of the basket hilt of the broadsword on the wall, six all white out of the meal tub, and so from all parts of the cottage to the riverside. And amongst them Colin spied the little girl creeping on board the Queen's boat, with her pinafore to her eyes, and the Queen was shaking her fist at her. In five minutes more they had all scrambled into the boats, and the whole fleet was in motion down the stream. In another moment the cottage was empty, and everything had returned to its usual size. They'll be all dashed to pieces on the rocks, cried Colin, jumping up and running into the garden. When he reached the fall, there was nothing to be seen but the swift plunge and rush of the broken water in the moonlight. He thought he heard cries and shouts coming up from below, and fancied he could distinguish the sobs of the little maiden whom he had so foolishly lost but the sounds might be only those of the water, for to the different voices of a running stream there is no end. He followed its course all the way to its old channel, but saw nothing to indicate any disaster. Then he crept back to his bed, where he lay thinking what a fool he had been, till he cried himself to sleep over the little girl who would never grow into a woman. End of section six. Fantasy Fairies and Ghosts by Various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Carasoin, Chapter Three. The Old Woman and Her Hen. In the morning, however, his courage had returned for the word carasoin was always saying itself in his brain. People in fairy stories, he said, always find what they want. Why should not I find this carasoin? It does not seem likely. But the world doesn't go round by likely, so I will try. But how was he to begin? When Colin did not know what to do, he always did something. So as soon as his father was gone to the hill, he wandered up the stream down which the fairies had come. But I needn't go on so, he said, for if the carasoin grew in the fairies' country, the queen would know how to get it. All at once he remembered how he had lost himself on the moor when he was a little boy, and had gone into a hut and found there an old woman spinning. And she had told him such stories and shown him the way home. So he thought she might be able to help him now, for he remembered that she was very old then, and must be older and still wiser now. And he resolved to go and look for the hut, and ask the old woman what he was to do. So he left the stream and climbed the hill, and soon came upon a desolate moor. The sun was clouded, and the wind was cold, and everything looked dreary, and there was no sign of a hut anywhere. He wandered on, looking for it, and all at once found that he had forgotten the way back. At the same instant he saw the hut right before him, and then he remembered. It was when he had lost himself that he saw it the former time. It seems the way to find some things, is to lose yourself, said he to himself. He went up to the cottage, which was like a large beehive built of turf, and knocked at the door. Come in, Colin, 
said a voice, and he entered, stooping low. The old woman sat by a little fire, spinning after the old fashion, with a distaff and spindle. She stopped the moment he went in. Come and sit down by the fire, she said, and tell me what you want. Then Colin saw that she had no eyes. I am very sorry you are blind, he said. Never you mind that, my dear. I see more than you do for all my blindness. Tell me what you want, and I shall see at least what I can do for you. How do you know I want anything? asked Colin. Now that's what I don't like, said the old woman. Why do you waste words? Words should not be wasted any more than crumbs. I beg your pardon, returned Colin. I will tell you all about it. And so he told her the whole story. Oh, those children, those children, said the old woman. They are always doing some mischief. They never know how to enjoy themselves without hurting somebody or other. I really must give that queen a bit of my mind. Well, my dear, I like you, and I will tell you what must be done. You shall carry the silly queen her bottle of carasoin. But she won't like it when she gets it, I can tell her. That's my business. However, first of all, Colin, you must dream three days without sleeping. Next, you must work three days without dreaming. And last, you must work and dream three days together. How am I to do all that? I will help you all I can, but a great deal will depend on yourself. In the meantime, you must have something to eat. So saying, she rose, and going to a corner behind her bed, returned with a large golden-coloured egg in her hand. This she laid on the hearth, and covered over with hot ashes. She then chatted away to Colin about his father and the sheep and the cow and the housework and showed that she knew all about him. At length she drew the ashes off the egg and put it on the plate. It shines like silver now, said Colin. That is a sign it is quite done, said she, and set it before him. Colin had never tasted anything half so nice and he had never seen such a quantity of meat in an egg. Before he had finished it, he had made a hearty meal, but in the meantime the old woman said, Shall I tell you a story while you have your dinner? Oh, yes, please do, answered Colin. You told me such stories before. Jenny, said the old woman, my wool is all done. Get me some more. And from behind the bed, out came a sober coloured, but large and beautifully shaped hen. She walked sedately across the floor, putting down her feet daintily, like a prim matron as she was, and stopping by the door, gave a cluck cluck. Oh, the door is shut, is it? said the old woman. Let me open it, said Colin. Do, my dear. What are all those white things, he asked, for the cottage stood in the middle of a great bed of grass with white tops. Those are my sheep, said the old woman. You will see. Into the grass Jenny walked, and stretching up her neck, gathered the white woolly stuff in her beak. When she had as much as she could hold, she came back and dropped it on the floor then picked the seeds out and swallowed them, and went back for more. The old woman took the wool, and fastening it on her distaff, began to spin, giving the spindle a twirl, and then dropping it and drawing out the thread from the distaff. But as soon as the spindle began to twirl, it began to sparkle all the colours of the rainbow that it was a delight to see. And the hands of the woman, 
instead of being old and wrinkled, were young and long-fingered and fair, and they drew out the wool, and the spindle spun and flashed, and the hen kept going out and in, bringing wool and swallowing the seeds, and the old woman kept telling Colin one story after another, till he thought he could sit there all his life and listen. Sometimes it seemed the spindle that was flashing them, sometimes the long fingers that were spinning them, and sometimes the hen that was gathering them off the roads of the long dry grass and bringing them in her beak and laying them down on the floor. All at once the spindle grew slower and gradually ceased turning. The fingers stopped drawing out the thread, the hen retreated behind the bed, and the voice of the blind woman was silent. I suppose it is time for me to go, said Colin. Yes, it is, answered his hostess. Please tell me then, how am I to dream three days without sleeping? That's over, said the old woman. You've just finished that part. I told you I would help you all I could. Have I been here three days then? asked Colin in astonishment. And nights too. And I and Jenny and the spindle are quite tired and want to sleep. Jenny has got three eggs to lay besides. Make haste, my boy. Please, then tell me what I am to do next. Jenny will put you in the way. When you come where you are going, you will tell them that the old woman with the spindle desires them to lift Cumberbone Crag a yard higher, and to send a flue under stone starvit moss. Jenny, show Colin the way. Jenny came out with a surly cluck, and led him a good way across the heath, by a path only a hen could have found. But she turned suddenly, and walked home again. End of section 7「The Fantasy Fairies and Ghosts » by Various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Carasoin, Chapter 4. The Goblin Blacksmith. Colin could just perceive something suggestive of a track, which he followed till the sun went down. Then he saw a dim light before him, keeping his eye upon which. He came at last to a smithy where, Looking in at the open door, he saw a huge hump-backed smith working a forehammer in each hand. He grinned out of the middle of his breast when he saw Colin and said, Come in, come in, my youngsters will be glad of you. He was an awful-looking creature with a great hair lip and a red ball for a nose. Whatever he did speak or laugh or sneeze, he did not stop working one moment. As often as the sparks flew in his face, he snapped at them with his eyes, which were the colour of a half-dead coal, now with this one, now with that, and the more sparks they got into them, the brighter his eyes grew. The moment Colin entered, he took a huge bar of iron from the furnace, and began laying on it so with his two forehammers that he disappeared in a cloud of sparks, and Colin had to shut his eyes and be glad to escape with a few burns on his face and hands. When he had beaten the iron till it was nearly black, the smith put it in the fire again and called out a hundred odd names. Here, gob, shag, latchet, liquor, freestone, grey wacket, mouse trap potato pot, blob, blotch, blunker. And ever as he called, one dwarf after another came tumbling out of the chimney, in the corner of which the fire was roaring. They crowded about Colin and began to make hideous faces and spit fire at him, but he kept a bold countenance. At length one pinched him, and he could not stand that, but struck him hard on the head. He thought he had knocked his own hand to pieces, it gave him such a jar, and the head rung like an iron pot. 
Come, come, young man, cried the smith. You keep your hands off my children. Tell them to keep their hands off me, then, said Colin. And calling to mind his message, just as they began to crowd about him again, with yet more spiteful looks, he added, Here, you imps, I won't stand it longer. Get to your work directly. The old woman with the spindle says you're to lift Cumberbone Crag a yard higher, and to send a flue under Stone Starvit Moss. In a moment they had vanished in the chimney. In a moment more the smithy rocked to its foundations, but the smith took no notice, only worked more furiously than ever. Then came a great crack, and a shock that threw Colin on the floor. The smith reeled, but never lost hold of his hammers or missed a blow on the anvil. Those boys will do themselves a mischief, he said, then turning to Colin. Here, you, sir, take that hammer. This is no safe place for idle people. If you don't work, you'll be knocked to pieces in no time. The same moment there came a wind from the chimney that blew all the fire into the middle of the smithy. The smith dashed up upon the forge and rushed out of sight. Presently he returned with one of the goblins under his arm, kicking and screaming, laid his ugly head down on the anvil where he held him by the neck, and hit him a great blow with his hammer above the ear. The hammer rebounded and the goblin gave a shriek, and the smith flung him into the chimney, saying, That's the only way to serve him. You'll be more careful for one while, I guess, Slobberkin. And thereupon he took up his other hammer and began to work again, saying to Colin, Now, young man, as long as you get a blow with your hammer in for every one of mine, you'll be quite safe. But if you stop or lose the beat, I won't be answerable to the old woman with the spindle for the consequences. Colin took up the hammer and did his best but he soon found that he had never known what it was to work. The smith worked a hammer in each hand, and it was all Colin could do to work his little hammer with both his hands, so it was a terrible exertion to put in blow for blow with the smith. Once, when he lost the time, the smith's forehammer came down on the head of his, beat it flat on the anvil, and flung the handle to the other end of the smithy where it struck the wall like the report of a cannon. I told you, said the smith, there's another. Make haste, for the boys will be in want of you and me too before they get Cumberbone Crag half a foot higher. Presently in came the biggest headed of the family, out of the chimney. Six foot wedges and a three yard crowbar, he said, or Cumberbone will cumber our bones presently. The smith rushed behind the bellows, brought out a bar of iron three inches thick or so, cut off three yards, put the end in the fire, blew with might and main, and brought it out as white as paper. He and Colin then laid upon it till the end was flattened to an edge which the smith turned up a little. He then handed the tool to the imp. Here, Gob, he said, run with it, and the wedges will be ready by the time you come back. Then to the wedges they set, and Colin worked like three. He never knew how he could work before. Not a moment's pause, except when the smith was at the forge for another glowing mass, and yet to Colin's amazement, the more he worked, the stronger he seemed to grow. Instead of being worn out, the moment he had got his breath, he wanted to be at it again, and he felt as if he had grown twice the size since he took hammer in hand. And the goblins kept running in and out all the time, now for one thing, now for another. Colin thought if they made use of all the tools they fetched, they must be working very hard indeed. And the convulsions felt in the smithy bore witness to their exertions somewhere in the neighbourhood. And the longer they worked together, 
the more friendly grew the smith. At length he said his words, always adding energy to his blows. What does the old woman want to improve stone starve it moss for? I didn't know she did want to improve it, returned Colin. Why, anybody may see that. First she wants Cumberbone Crag a yard higher, just enough to send the northeast blast over the moss without touching it. Then she wants a hot flue passed under it, plain as a forehammer. What did you ask her to do for you? She's always doing things for people and making my bones ache. You don't seem to mind it much, though, sir, said Colin. No more I do, answered the smith, with a blow that drove the anvil halfway into the earth, from which it took him some trouble to drag it out again. But I want to know what she is after now. So Colin told him all he knew about it, which was merely his own story. I see, I see, said the smith. It's all moonshine, but we must do as she says notwithstanding. And now it is my turn to give you a lift, for you have worked well. As soon as you leave the smithy, go straight to Stone Starve It Moss. Get on the highest part of it, make a circle three yards across, and dig a trench round it. I will give you a spade. At the end of the first day, you will see a vine break the earth. By the end of the second, it will be creeping all over the circle. And by the end of the third day, the grapes will be ripe. Squeeze them one by one into a bottle. I will give you a bottle till it is full. Cork it up tight, and by the time the queen comes for it, it will be carasoin. Oh, thank you. Thank you, cried Colin. When am I to go? As soon as the boys have lifted Cumberbone Crag and bored the flue under the moss, it is of no use till then. Well, I'll go on with my work, said Colin, and struck away at the anvil. In a minute or two in came the same goblin, whose head his father had hammered, and said respectfully, It's all right, sir. The boys are gathering their tools, and we'll be home to supper directly. Are you sure you have lifted the crag a yard? said the smith. Slumkin says it's a half inch over the yard. Grungle says it's three quarters, but that won't matter, will it? No, I dare say not. But it is much better to be accurate. Is the flu done? Yes, we managed that partly in lifting the crag. Very well. How's your head? It rings a little. Let it ring you a lesson then, Slobberkin, in future. Yes, sir. Now, master, you may go when you like, said the smith to Colin, with nothing here you can eat, I am sorry to say. Oh, I don't mind that. I'm not very hungry. But the old woman with the spindle said I was to work three days without dreaming. Well, you haven't been dreaming, have you? And the smith looked quite furious as he put the question, lifting his forehammer as if he would serve Colin like Slobberkin. No, that I haven't, answered Colin. You took good care of that, sir. The smith actually smiled. Then go along, he said. It is all right. But I've only worked three whole days and nights, interrupted the smith. Get along with you. The boys will bother you if you don't. Here's your spade, and here's your bottle. End of section 8 Of Fantasy, Fairies and Ghosts by Various This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Carasoin, Chapter 5 The Moss Vineyard Colin did not need a hint more but was out at the smithy in a moment. He turned, however, to ask the way. There was nothing in sight but a great heap of peats which had been dug out of the moss and was standing there to dry. Could he be on stone starve it moss already? The sun was just setting. 
he would look out for the highest point at once so he kept climbing and at last reached a spot whence he could see all round him for a long way surely that must be cumberbone crag looking down on him and there at his feet lay one of jenny's eggs as bright as silver and there was a little path trodden and scratched by jenny's feet enclosing a circle just the size the smith told him to make he set to work at once ate jenny's egg and then dug the trench those three days were the happiest he had ever known for he understood everything he did himself and all that everything was doing round about him he saw what the rushes were and why the blossom came out at the side and why it was russet coloured and why the pitch was white and the skin green and he said to himself if i were a rush now that's just how I should make a point of growing. And he knew how the heather felt with its cold roots and its head of purple bells and the wise-looking cotton grass, which the old woman called her sheep, and the white beard of which she spun into thread. And he knew what she spun it for, namely, to weave it into lovely white cloth, of which to make nightgowns for all the good people that were like to die for one with one of these nightgowns upon him never died but was laid in a beautiful white bed and the door was closed upon him and no noise came near him and he lay there dreaming lovely cool dreams till the world was turned round and was ready for him to get up again and do something he felt the wind playing with every blade of grass in his charmed circle he felt the rays of heat shooting up from the hot flue beneath the moss. He knew the moment when the vine was going to break from the earth, and he felt the juices gathering and flowing from the roots into the grapes. And all the time he seemed at home, tending the cow, or making his father's supper, or reading a fairy tale, as he sat waiting for him to come home. At length the evening of the third day arrived. Colin squeezed the rich red grapes into his bottle, corked it, shouldered his spade, and turned homewards, guided by a peak which he knew in the distance. After walking all night in the moonlight, he came at length upon a place which he recognised, and so down upon the brook which he followed home. He met his father going out with his sheep. Great was his delight to see Colin again, for he had been dreadfully anxious about him. Colin told him the whole story, and as at that time marvels were much easier to believe than they are now, Colin's father did not laugh at him, but went away to the hills thinking, while Colin went on to the cottage, where he found plenty to do, having been nine days gone. He laid the bottle carefully away with his Sunday clothes, and set about everything just as usual. But though the fairy brook was running merrily as ever through the cottage, and although Colin watched late every night, and latest when the moon shone, no fairy fleet came glimmering and dancing in along the stream. Autumn was there at length, and cold fogs began to rise in the cottage, and so Colin turned the brook into its old course, and filled up the breaches in the walls and the channel along the floor making all close against the blasts of winter. But he had never known such a weary winter before. He could not help constantly thinking how cold the little girl must be, and how she would be saying to herself, I wish Colin hadn't been so silly and lost me. End of section 9 Section 10 of Fantasy, Fairies and Ghosts by Various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Carasoin, Chapter 6, The Consequences. But at last the spring came, and after the spring, the summer. And the very first warm day, Colin took his spade and pickaxe, and down rushed the stream once more, singing and bounding into the cottage. Colin was even more delighted than he had been the first time, and he watched late into the night, 
but there came neither moon nor fairy fleet, and more than a week passed thus. At length, on the ninth night, Colin, who had just fallen asleep, opened his eyes with sudden wakefulness, and behold, the room was all in a glimmer with moonshine and fairy glitter. The boats were rocking on the water, and the queen and her court had landed and were dancing merrily on the earthen floor. He lost no time. Queen, queen, he said, I've got your bottle of carasoin. The dance ceased in a moment, and the queen bounded upon the edge of his bed. I can't bear the look of your great glaring ugly eyes, she said. I must make you less before I can talk to you. So once more she laid her rush wand across his eyes, whereupon Colin saw them all six times the size they were before, and the queen went on. Where is the carasoin? Give it to me. It is in my box under the bed. If your majesty will stand out of the way, I will get it for you. The queen jumped on the floor, and Colin, leaning from the bed, pulled out his little box and got out the bottle. There it is, your majesty, he said, but not offering it to her. Give it to me directly, said the queen, holding out her hand. First, give me my little girl, returned Colin boldly. Do you dare to bargain with me, said the queen angrily. Your majesty deigned to bargain with me first, said Colin. But since then you tried to break all our necks. You made a wicked cataract out of there on the other side of the garden. Our boats were all dashed to pieces, and we had to wait till our horses were fetched. If I had been killed, you couldn't have held me to my bargain, and I won't hold to it now. If you chose to go down my cataract, began Colin. Your cataract, cried the Queen. All the waters that run from Loch Lonely are mine. I can tell you all the way to the sea, except where they run through farmyards, Your Majesty. I'll rout you out of the country, said the Queen. Meantime, I'll put the bottle in the chest again, returned Colin. The queen bit her lips with vexation. Come here, changeling, she cried at length in a flattering tone. And the little girl came slowly up to her and stood staring at Colin with the tears in her eyes. Give me your hand, little girl, said he, holding out his. She did so. It was cold as ice. Let go her hand, said the queen. I won't, said Colin. She's mine. Give me the bottle, then, said the queen. Don't, said the child. But it was too late. The queen had it. Keep your girl, she cried with an ugly laugh. Yes, keep me, cried the child. The cry ended in a hiss. Colin felt something slimy wriggling in his grasp, and looking down, saw that instead of a little girl, he was holding a great writhing worm. He had almost flung it from him, but recovering himself, he grasped it tighter. If it's a snake, I'll choke it, he said. If it's a girl, I'll keep her. The same instant it changed to a little white rabbit, which looked him piteously in the face and pulled to get its little forefoot out of his hand. But though he tried not to hurt it, Colin would not let it go. Then the rabbit changed to a great black cat with eyes that flashed green fire. She sputtered and spit and swelled her tail, but all to no purpose. Colin held fast. Then it was a wood pigeon, struggling and fluttering in terror to get its wing out of his hold, but Colin still held fast. All this time the queen had been getting the cork out. The moment it yielded, she gave a scream and dropped the bottle. The carasoin ran out, and a strange odour filled the cottage. The queen stood shivering and sobbing beside the bottle, and all her court came about her, and shivered and sobbed too, and their faces grew ancient and wrinkled. 
Then the queen, bending and tottering like an old woman, led the way to the boats, and her courtiers followed her, limping and creeping and distorted. Colin stared in amazement. He saw them all go aboard, and he heard the sound of them like a far-off company of men and women, crying bitterly. And away they floated down the stream, the rowers dipping no oar, but bending, weeping over them, and letting the boats drift along the stream. They vanished from his sight, and the rush of the cataract came up on the night wind, louder than he had ever heard it before. But alas, when he came to himself, he found his hand relaxed, and the dove flown. Once more there was nothing left but to cry himself asleep, as he well might. In the morning he rose very wretched, but the moment he entered the cowhouse, there, beside the cow on a milking stool, sat a lovely little girl, with just one white garment on her, crying bitterly. I am so cold, she said, sobbing. He caught her up, ran with her into the house, put her into the bed and ran back to the cow for a bowl of warm milk. This she drank eagerly, laid her head down and fell fast asleep. Then Colin saw that though she must be eight years old by her own account, her face was scarcely older than that of a baby of as many months. When his father came home, you may be sure he stared to see the child in the bed. Colin told him what had happened, but his father said he had met a troop of gypsies on the hill that morning. And you were always a dreamer, Colin, even before you could speak. But don't you smell the carasoin still? said Colin. I do smell something very pleasant, to be sure, returned his father but I think it is the wallflower on the top of the garden wall. What a blossom there is of it this year! I am sure there is nothing sweeter in all fairyland, Colin. Colin allowed that. The little girl slept for three whole days, and for three days more she never said another word than, I am so cold. But after that she began to revive a little, and to take notice of things about her. For three weeks she would taste nothing but milk from the cow, and would not move from the chimney corner. By degrees, however, she began to help Colin a little with his housework, and as she did so, her face gathered more and more expression, and she made such progress that by the end of three months she could do everything as well as Colin himself and certainly more neatly. Whereupon he gave up his duties to her, and went out with his father to learn the calling of a shepherd. Thus things went on for three years, and Fairy, as they called her, grew lovelier every day, and looked up to Colin more and more every day. At the end of the three years his father sent him to an old friend of his, a schoolmaster, before he left, he made Fairy promise never to go near the brook after sundown. He had turned it into its old channel the very day she came to them, and he begged his father especially to look after her when the moon was high, for then she grew very restless and strange, and her eyes looked as if she saw things other people could not see. When the end of the other three years had come, the schoolmaster would not let Colin go home, but insisted on sending him to college, and there he remained for three years more. When he returned at the end of that time, he found Fairy so beautiful and so wise that he fell dreadfully in love with her, and Fairy found out that she had been in love with him since ever so long she did not know how long and Colin's father agreed that they should be married as soon as Colin should have a house to take her to. So Colin went away to London and worked very hard, till at last he managed to get a little cottage in Devonshire to live in. Then he went back to Scotland and married Fairy. And he was very glad to get her away from the neighbourhood, 
of a queen who was not to be depended upon. End of section 10. See Fairies and Ghosts by Various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Carasoin, Chapter 7. The Banished Fairies. Those fairies had for a long time been doing wicked things. They had played many ill-natured pranks upon the human mortals, had stolen children upon whom they had no claim, had refused to deliver them up when they were demanded of them, had even terrified infants in their cradles, and, final proof of moral declension in fairies, had attempted to get rid of the obligations of their word by all kinds of trickery and false logic. It was not till they had sunk thus low that their queen began to long for the carousoin. She, no more than if she had been a daughter of Adam, could be happy while going on in that way, and therefore, having heard of its marvellous virtues, and thinking it would stop her growing misery, she tried hard to procure it. For a hundred years she had tried in vain. Not till Colin arose did she succeed. But the carousoin was only for really good people, and therefore, when the iron bottle which contained it was uncorked, she and all her attendants were, by the vapours thereof, suddenly changed into old men and women fairies. They crowded away weeping and lamenting, and Colin had as yet seen them no more. For when the wickedness of any fairy tribe reaches its climax, the punishment that falls upon them is that they are compelled to leave that part of the country where they and their ancestors have lived for more years than they can count, and wander away driven by an inward restlessness, ever longing after the country they have left, but never able to turn round and go back to it. Always thinking they will do so tomorrow, but when tomorrow comes, saying tomorrow again, till at last they find not their old home, but the place of their doom, that is, a place where their restlessness leaves them, and they find they can remain. This partial repose, however, springs from no satisfaction with the place. It is only that their inward doom ceases to drive them further. They sit down to weep, and to long after the country they have left. This is not because the country to which they have been driven is ugly, and in Clement it may or may not be such. It is simply because it is not their country. If it would be, and it must be, torture to the fairy of a harebell to go and live in a hyacinth, a torture quite analogous to which many human beings undergo from their birth to their death, and some of them longer. For anything I can tell think what it must be for the tribe of fairies to have to go and live in a country quite different from that in and for which they were born. To the whole tribe, the country is what the flower is to the individual. And when a fairy is born to whom the whole country is what the individual flower is to the individual fairy, then the fairy is king or queen of the fairies, and always makes a new nursery rhyme for the young fairies, which is never forgotten. When, therefore, a tribe is banished, it is long before they can settle themselves into their new quarters. Their clothes do not fit them, as it were. They are constantly wriggling themselves into harmony with their new circumstances, which is only another word for clothes, and never quite succeeding. It is their punishment, and something more. Consequently, their temper is not always of the evenest. Indeed, and in a word, they are as like human mortals as may well be, considering the differences between them. In the present case, you would say it was surely no great hardship to be banished from the heathy hills, the bare rocks, the wee trotting burnies of Scotland, to the rich valleys, the wooded shores, the great rivers, the grand ocean of the south of Devon. 
You may say they could not have been very wicked when this was all their punishment. If you do, you must have studied the human mortals to no great purpose. You do not believe that a man may be punished by being made very rich? I do. Anyhow, these fairies were not of your opinion, for they were in it. In the splendour of their Devon banishment, they sighed for their bare Scotland. Under the leafy foliage of the Devonshire valleys, with the purple and green ocean before them, that had seen ships of a thousand builds, or on the shore, rich with shells and many-coloured creatures, they longed for the clear, cold, pensive, open sides of the far-stretching heathy sweeps, to which a grey, wild, torn sea, with memories only of Norsemen, whales and mermaids, cried aloud. For the big rivers, on which reposed great old hulks, scarred with battle, they longed after the rocks and stones, and rowan and birch trees of the solitary burns. The country they had left might be an ill-favoured thing, but it was their own. Now, that which happens to the aspect of a country when the fairies leave it, is that a kind of deadness falls over the landscape. The traveller feels the wind as before, but it does not seem to refresh him. The child sighs over his daisy chain, and cannot find a red-tipped one amongst all that he has gathered. The cowslips have not half the honey in them. The wasps outnumber the bees. The horses come from the plough more tired at night, hanging their heads to their very hoofs as they plod homewards. The youth and the maiden, though perfectly happy when they meet, find the road to and from the trysting place unaccountably long and dreary. The hawthorn blossom is neither so white nor so red as it used to be, and the dark rough bark looks through and makes it ragged. The day is neither so warm nor the night so friendly as before. In a word, that something which no one can describe or be content to go without is missing. Everything is commonplace. Everything falls short of one's expectations. But it does not follow that the country to which the fairies are banished is so much richer and more beautiful for their presence. If that country has its own fairies, it needs no more, and Devon, in especial, has been rich in fairies from the time of the Phoenicians, and ever so long before that. But supposing there were no Aborigines left to quarrel with, it takes centuries before the new immigration can fit itself into its new home. Until this comes about, the queerest things are constantly happening. For however could a convolvulus grow right with the soul of a Canterbury bell inside it, for instance. The banished fairies are forced to do the best they can, and take the flowers the nearest they can find. End of section 11 A Fantasy Fairies and Ghosts by Various This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Carasoin Chapter 8 Their Revenge when Colin and his wife settled then in their farmhouse, the same tribe of fairies was already in the neighbourhood, and was not long in discovering who had come after them. An assembly was immediately called. Something must be done, but what was disputed? Most of them thought only of revenge to be taken upon the children, but the Queen hesitated. Perhaps her sufferings had done her good. She suggested that before coming to any conclusion, they should wait and watch the household. In consequence of this resolution, they began to frequent the house constantly, and sometimes in great numbers. But for a long time they could do the children no mischief. Whatever they tried turned out to their amusement. They were three two girls and a boy, the girls nine and eight, and the boy three years old. 
When they succeeded in enticing them beyond the home boundaries, they would at one time be seized with an unaccountable panic, and turn and scurry home without knowing why. At another, a great butterfly or dragonfly, or some other winged and lovely creature, would dart past them, and away towards the house, and they after it scampering, or the voice of their mother would be heard calling from the door. But at last their opportunity arrived. One day the children were having such a game. The sisters had blindfolded their little brother, and were carrying him now on their backs, now in their arms, all about the place, now up the stairs, talking about the rugged mountain paths they were climbing, now down again, filling him with the fancy that they were descending into a narrow valley. Then they would set the tap of a rainwater barrel running, and represent that they were travelling along the bank of a rivulet. Now they were threading the depths of a great forest, and when the low of a cow reached them from the nigh field, that was the roaring of a lion or a tiger. At length they reached a lake, into which the rivulet ran, and then it was necessary to take off his shoes and socks, that he might skim over the water on his bare feet, which they dipped and dabbled now in this tub, now in that, standing for farm and household purposes by the water-butt. The sisters kept their own imaginations alive by carrying him through all the strange places inside and outside of the house. When they told him they were ascending a precipice, they were, in fact, climbing a rather difficult ladder up to the door of the hayloft. When they told him they were traversing a pathless desert, they were, in fact, in a vast empty place, a wide floor, used sometimes as a granary, with the rafters of the roof coming down to it on both sides, a place abundantly potent in their feelings to the generation of the desert in his. When they were wandering through a trackless forest, they were, in fact, winding about amongst the trees of a large orchard, which in the moonlight was vast enough for the fancy of any child. Had they uncovered his eyes at any moment, he would only have been seized with a wonder and awe of another sort, more overwhelming because more real, and more strange because not even in part bodied forth from his own brain. In the course of the story, and while they bore the barefooted child through the orchard, telling him they saw the fairies gliding about everywhere through the trees, not thinking that he believed every word they told him, they set him down, and the child suddenly opened his eyes. His sisters were gone. The moon was staring at him out of the sky, through the mossy branches of the apple trees, which he thought looked like old women all about him, they were so thin and bony. When the sisters, who had only for a moment run behind some of the trees, that they might cause him additional amazement, returned, he was gone. There was terrible lamentation in the house, but his father and mother, who were experienced in such matters, knew that the fairies must be in it and cherished a hope that their son would yet be restored to them, though all their endeavours to find him were unavailing. End of section 12《of Fantasy Fairies and Ghosts by Various This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Carasoin Chapter 9 The Fairy Fiddler the father thought over many plans, but never came upon the right one. He did not know that they were the same tribe which had before carried away his wife when she was an infant. If he had, they might have done something sooner. At length, one night, towards the close of seven years, about twelve o'clock, Colin suddenly opened his eyes, for he had been fast asleep and dreaming and saw a few grotesque figures which he thought he must have seen before, dancing on the floor between him and the nearly extinguished fire. One of them had a violin, but when Colin first saw him he was not playing, 
another of them was singing, and thus keeping the dance in time. This was what he sang, evidently addressed to the fiddler who stood in the centre of the dance. Peterkin, Peterkin, tall and thin, what have you done with his cheek and his chin? What have you done with his ear and his eye? Hearken, hearken, and hear him cry. Here Peterkin put his fiddle to his neck and drew from it a wail just like the cry of a child, at which the dancers danced more furiously. Then he went on playing the tune the other had just sung in accompaniment to his own reply. Silver snout, silver snout, short and stout, I have cut them off and plucked them out and salted them down in the Kelpie's pool because Papa Colin is such a fool. Then the fiddle cried like a child again and they danced more wildly than ever. Colin, filled with horror, although he did not more than half believe what they were saying, sat up in bed and stared at them with fierce eyes, waiting to hear what they would say next. Silver Snout now resumed his part. Ho, 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 and if he don't know, and fished them out of the pool so-so. Here they all pretended to be hauling in a net as they danced. Before the end of the seven long years, sweet babe will be left without eyes or ears. Then Peterkin replied, Sweet babe will be left without cheek or chin, only a hole to put porridge in, porridge and milk and haggis and cakes. Sweet babe will gobble till his stomach aches. From this last verse, Colin knew that they must be Scotch fairies, and all at once recollected their figures as belonging to the multitude he had once seen frolicking in his father's cottage. It was now Silver Snout's turn. He began. But never more shall Colin see Sweet Babe again upon his knee, with or without his cheek or chin, except... Here Silver Snout caught sight of Colin's face, staring at him from the bed, and with a shriek of laughter they all vanished. The tones of Peterkin's fiddle trailing after them through the darkness, like the train of a shooting star. End of section 13《Fantasy Fairies and Ghosts by Various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Carasoin, Chapter 10. The Old Woman and Her Hen. Now Colin had got the better of these fairies once, not by his own skill, but by the help that other powers had afforded him. What were those powers? First, the old woman on the heath. Indeed, he might attribute it all to her. He would go back to Scotland and look for her and find her. But the old woman was never found except by the seeker losing himself. It could not be done otherwise. She would cease to be the old woman and become her own hen, if ever the moment arrived when any one found her without losing himself. And Colin, since that time, had wandered so much all over the moor, wide as it was, that lay above his father's cottage, that he did not believe he was able to lose himself there any more. He had yet to learn that it did not so much matter where he lost himself, provided only he was lost. Just at this time Colin's purse was nearly empty, and he set out to borrow the money of a friend who lived on the other side of Dartmoor. When he got there, he found that he had gone from home. Unable to rest, he set out again to return. It was almost night when he started, and before he had got many miles into the moor, it was dark, for there was no moon, and it was so cloudy that he could not see the stars. He thought he knew the way quite well, but as the track, even in daylight, was in certain places very indistinct, it was no wonder that he strayed from it and found that he had lost himself. The same moment that he became aware of this, he saw a light away to the left. 
he turned towards it and found it proceeded from a little hive-like hut the door of which stood open when he was within a yard or two of it he heard a voice say come in colin i'm waiting for you colin obeyed at once and found the old woman seated with her spindle and distaff just as he had seen her when he was a boy on the moor above his father's cottage how do you do mother he said i am always quite well never ask me that question well then i won't any more returned colin but i thought you lived in scotland i don't live anywhere but those that will do as i tell them will always find me when they want me do you see yet mother see i always see so well that it is not worth while to burn eye light so i let them go out they were expensive where her eyes should have been there was nothing but wrinkles what do you want she resumed i want my child the fairies have got him i know that and they have taken out his eyes i can make him see without them and they've cut off his ears said colin he can hear without them and they've salted down his cheek and his chin now i don't believe that said the old woman i heard them say so myself returned colin those fairies are worse liars than any i know but something must be done sit down and i'll tell you a story there's only nine days of the seven years left said colin in a tone of expostulation i know that as well as you answered the old woman therefore i say there is not time to be lost sit down and listen to my story here jenny the hen came pacing solemnly out from under the bed off to the sheep shearing jenny and make haste for i must spin faster than usual there are but nine days left jenny ran out at the door with her head on a level with her tail as if the kite had been after her in a few moments she returned with a bunch of wool as they called it though it was only cotton from the cotton grass that grew all about the cottage nearly as big as herself in her bill and then darted away for more the old woman fastened it on her distaff drew out a thread to her spindle and then began to spin and as she spun she told her story fast fast and jenny kept scampering out and in and by the time colin thought it must be midnight the story was told and seven of the nine days were over colin said the old woman now that you know all about it you must set off at once i am ready answered colin rising keep on the road jenny will show you till you come to the cobbler's tell him the old woman with the distaff requests him to give you a lump of his wax and what am i to do with it the cobbler always knows what his wax is for and with this answer the old woman turned her face towards the fire for although it was summer it was cold at night on the moor colin moved by sudden curiosity instead of walking out of the hut after jenny as he ought to have done crept round by the wall and peeped in the old woman's face there instead of wrinkled blindness he saw a pair of flashing orbs of light which were rather reflected on the fire than had the fire reflected in them but the same instant the hut and all that was in it vanished he felt the cold fog of the moor blowing upon him and fell heavily to the earth end of section 14
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Carasoin, Chapter 11 The Goblin Cobbler When he came to himself, he lay on the moor still. He got up and gazed around. The moon was up but there was no hut to be seen. He was sorry enough now that he had been so foolish. He called Jenny, Jenny, but in vain. What was he to do? Tomorrow was the eighth of the nine days left, and if before twelve at night the following day he had not rescued his boy, nothing could be done, at least for seven years more. True, the year was not quite out till about seven the following evening, but the fairies, instead of giving days of grace, always take them. He could do nothing but begin to walk, simply because that gave him a shadow more of a chance of finding the cobblers than if he sat still. But there was no possibility of choosing one direction rather than another. He wandered the rest of that night and the next day, he could not go home before the hour when the cobbler could no longer help him. Such was his anxiety, that although he neither ate nor drank, he never thought of the cause of his gathering weakness. As it grew dark, however, he became painfully aware of it, and was just on the point of sitting down exhausted upon a great white stone that looked inviting, when he saw a faint glimmering in front of him. He was erect in a moment, and making towards the place. As he drew near, he became aware of a noise made up of many smaller noises, such as might have proceeded from some kind of factory. Not till he was close to the place could he see that it was a long, low hut, with one door and no windows. The light shone from the door which stood wide open. He approached and peeped in. There sat a multitude of cobblers, each on his stool, with his candle stuck in the hole in the seat, cobbling away. They looked rather like little men, though not at all of fairy size. The most remarkable thing about them was that at any given moment they were all doing precisely the same thing, as if they had been a piece of machinery. When one drew the threads in stitching, they all did the same. If Colin saw one wax his thread and looked up, he saw that they were all waxing their thread. If one took to hammering on his lapstone, they did not follow his example, but all together with him they caught up their lapstones and fell to hammering away, as if nothing but hammering could ever be demanded of them. And when he came to look at them more closely, he saw that every one was blind of an eye and had a nose turned up like an awl. Every one of them, however, looked different from the rest, notwithstanding a very close resemblance in their features. The moment they caught sight of him, they rose as one man, pointed their awls at him, and advanced towards him like a closing bush of aloes, glittering with spikes. Fine upper leathers, said one and all, with a variety of accordant grimaces. Top of his head, good paste bowl, was the next general remark. Coarse hair, good ends, followed. Sinews, good thread. Bones and blood, good, paste for seven leaguers. Ears, good, loops to pull em on with, pair short now. Soles, same for queen's slippers and so on they went, portioning out his body in the most irreverent fashion for the uses of their trade, till having come to his teeth and said, Teeth good, brads. They all gave a shriek, like the whisk of the waxed threads through the leather, and sprung upon him with their awls drawn back like daggers. There was no time to lose. The old woman with the spindle, said Colin. Don't know her, shrieked the cobblers. The old woman with the distaff, said Colin, and they all scurried back to their seats and fell to hammering vigorously. She desired me, continued Colin, to ask the cobbler for a lump of his wax. 
every one of them caught up his lump of wrought rosin and held it out to Colin. He took the one offered by the nearest and found that all their lumps were gone, after which they sat motionless and stared at him. But what am I to do with it? asked Colin. I will walk a little way with you, said the one nearest, and tell you all about it. The old woman is my grandmother, and a very worthy old soul she is. Colin stepped out at the door of the workshop, and the cobbler followed him. Looking round, Colin saw all the stools vacant, and the place as still as an old churchyard. The cobbler, who now in his talk, gestures, and general demeanour, appeared a very respectable, not to say conventional, little man, proceeded to give him all the information he required, accompanying it with the present of one of his favourite awls. They walked a long way, till Colin was amazed to find that his strength stood out so well, but at length the cobbler said, I see, sir, that the sun is at hand. I must return to my vocation. When the sun is once up, you will know where you are. He turned aside a few yards from the path and entered the open door of a cottage. In a moment the place resounded with the soft hammering of three hundred and thirteen cobblers, each with his candle stuck in a hole in the stool on which he sat. While Colin stood gazing in wonderment, the rim of the sun crept up above the horizon, and there the cottage stood, white and sleeping, while the cobblers, their lights, their stools, and their tools had all vanished. Only there was still the sound of the hammers ringing in his head, where it seemed to shape itself into words, something like these. A good deal had to give way to the rhyme for they were more particular about their rhymes than their etymology. Dub-a-dub, dub-a-dub, cobbler's man, hammer it, stitch it as fast as you can. The weekday ogre is wanting his boots. The tripper-trap fairy is going barefoots. Dream daughter has worn out her heels and her toeses, for want of cork slippers to walk over noses. Spark-eye the smith, may shoe the nightmare, the kelpie and pookie the nine-footed bear. We shoe the mermaids the tips of their tails, stitching the leather onto their scales. We shoe the brownie clumsy and toeless, and then he goes quiet as a mole or a molus. There is but one creature that we cannot shoe, and that is the boneless, all made of glue. A great deal of nonsense of this sort went through Colin's head before the sounds died away. Then he found himself standing in the field outside his own orchard. End of section 15the Carasoin, Chapter 12, The Wax and the Awl The evening arrived. The sun was going down over the sea, cloudless, casting gold from him lavishly, when Colin arrived on the shore at some distance from his home. The tide was falling, and a good space of sand was uncovered and lay glittering in the setting sun. This sand lay between some rocks and the sea, and from the rocks, innumerable runners of water that had been left behind in their hollows were hurrying back to their mother. These occasionally spread into little shallow lakes, resting in hollows in the sand. These lakes were in a constant ripple from the flow of the little streams through them, and the sun shining on these multitudinous ripples, the sand at the bottom shone like brown silk, watered with gold. Only that the golden lines were flitting about like living things, never for a moment in one place. Now Colin had no need of fairy ointment to anoint his eyes and make him able to see fairies. 
Most people need this, but Colin was naturally gifted. Therefore, as he drew near a certain high rock, which he knew very well, and from which many streams were flowing back into the sea, he saw that the little lakes about it were crowded with fairies, playing all kinds of pranks in the water. It was a lovely sight to see them thus frolicking in the light of the setting sun, in their gay dresses, sparkling with jewels, or what looked like jewels, flashing all colours as they moved. But Colin had not much time to see them, for the moment they saw him, knowing that this was the man whom they had wronged by stealing his child, and knowing, too, that he saw them, they fled at once up the high rock and vanished. This was just what Colin wanted. He went all round and round the rock, looked in every direction in which there might be a pool, found more fairies here and there, who fled like the first up the rock and disappeared. When he had thus driven them all from the sands, he approached the rock, taking the lump of cobbler's wax from his pocket as he went. He scrambled up the rock, and without showing his face, put his hand on the uppermost edge of it, and began drawing a line with the wax all along. He went creeping round the rock, still drawing the wax along the edge, till he had completed the circuit. Then, he peeped over. Now in the heart of this rock, which was nearly covered at high water, there was a big basin known as the Kelpie's Pool, filled with sea water and the loveliest seaweed and many little sea animals, and this was a favourite resort of the fairies. It was now, of course, crowded. When they saw his big head come peeping over, they burst into a loud fit of laughter, and began mocking him and making game of him in a hundred ways. Some made the ugliest faces they could, some queer gestures of contempt, others sung bits of songs, and so on, while the queen sat by herself on a projecting corner of the rock, with her feet in the water, and looked at him sulkily. Many of them kept on plunging and swimming and diving and floating while they mocked him, and Colin would have enjoyed the sight much if they had not spoiled their beauty and their motions by their grimaces and their gestures. I want my child, said Colin. Give him his child, cried one. Thereupon a dozen of them dived and brought up a huge sea slug, a horrid creature, like the lump of blubber, and held it up to him, saying, There he is, come down and fetch him. Others offered him a blue lobster, struggling in their grasp, others a spider crab, others a whelk, while some of them sung mocking verses, each capping the line the other gave. At length they lifted a dreadful object from the bottom. It was like a baby with his face half eaten away by the fishes, only that he had a huge nose, like the big toe of a lobster. But Colin was not to be taken in. Very well, good people, he said. I will try something else. He crept down the rock again, took out the little cobbler's awl, and began boring a hole. It went through the rock, as if it had been butter, and as he drew it out, the water followed in a far-reaching spout. He bored another, and went on boring till there were three hundred and thirteen spouts gushing from the rock, and running away in a strong little stream towards the sea. He then sat down on a ledge at the foot of the rock, and waited. By and by he heard a clamour of little voices from the basin. They had found that the water was getting very low. But when they discovered the holes by which it was escaping, He's got Dottle Cobb's all! He's got Dottle Cobb's all! they cried with one voice of horror. When he heard this, Colin climbed the rock again to enjoy their confusion. But here I must explain a little. In the former part of this history, I showed how fond these fairies were of water 
but the fact was they were far too fond of it. It had grown a thorough dissipation with them. Their business had been chiefly to tend and help the flowers in which they lived, and to do good offices for everything that had any kind of life about them. Hence their name of good people. But from finding the good the water did to the flowers, and from sharing in the refreshment it brought them, flowing up to them in tiny runners through the veins of the plants, they had fallen in love with the water itself, for its own sake, or rather for the pleasure it gave to them, irrespective of the good it was to the flowers which lived upon it. So they neglected their business, and took to sailing on the streams and plunging into every pool they could find. Hence the rapidity of their decline and fall. Again, on coming to the sea coast, they had found that the salt water did much to restore the beauty they had lost by partaking of the carousoin. Therefore, they were constantly on the shore, bathing forever in the water, especially that left in this pool by the ebbing tide, which was particularly to their taste, till at last they had grown entirely dependent for comfort on the sea water, and, they thought, entirely dependent on it for existence also, at least such existence as was in the least worth possessing. Therefore, when they saw the big face of Colin peering once more over the ledge, they rushed at him in a rage, scrambling up the side of the rock like so many mad beetles. Colin drew back and let them come on. The moment the foremost put his foot on the line that Colin had drawn around the rock, he slipped and tumbled backwards, head over heels into the pool, shrieking, He's got Dottlecob's wax! He's got Dottlecob's wax! screamed the next as he fell backwards after his companion, and this took place till no one would approach the line. In fact, no fairy could keep his footing on the wax, and the line was so broad, for as Colin rubbed it, it had melted and spread that not one of them could spring over it. The queen now rose. What do you want, Colin? she said. I want my child, as you know very well, answered Colin. Come and take him, returned the queen, and sat down again, not now with her feet in the water, for it was much too low for that. But Colin knew better. He sat down on the edge of the basin. Unfortunately, the tail of his coat crossed the line. In a moment, half a dozen of the fairies were out of the circle. Colin rose instantly, and there was not much harm done, for the multitude was still in prison. The water was nearly gone, beginning to leave the very roots of the long tangles uncovered. At length the queen could bear it no longer. "'Look here, Colin,' she said, "'I wish you well.' And as she spoke, she rose, and descended the side of the rock towards the water now far below her. She had to be very cautious, too. The stones were so slippery, though there was none of Dottlecob's wax there. About halfway below where the surface of the pool had been, she stopped and pushed a stone aside. Colin saw what seemed the entrance to a cave inside the rock. The queen went in. A few moments after, she came out wringing her hands. Oh, dear, oh, dear, what shall I do? She cried. You horrid, thick people will grow so. He's grown to such a size that I can't get him out. Will you let him go if I get him out? Asked Colin. I will, I will. We shall all be starved to death for want of sea water if I don't, she answered. Swear by the cobbler's awl and the cobbler's wax, said Colin. I swear, said the queen. By the cobbler's awl and the cobbler's wax, insisted Colin. I swear by the cobbler's awl and the cobbler's wax, returned the queen. In the name of your people? In the name of my people, 
said the queen, that none of us here present will ever annoy you or your family hereafter. Then I'll come down, said Colin, and jumped into the basin. With the cobbler's awl he soon cleared a big opening into the rock, for it bored and cut it like butter. Then out crept a beautiful boy of about ten years old, into his father's arms, with eyes and ears and chin and cheek, all safe and sound, and he carried him home to his mother. It was a disappointment to find him so much of a baby at his age, but that fault soon began to mend, and the house was full of jubilation, and little Colin told them the whole story of his sojourn among the fairies. And it did not take so long as you would think, for he fancied he had been there only about a week. End of section 16「of Fantasy, Fairies and Ghosts. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra. Fantasy, Fairies and Ghosts by Various. Section 17. Bonbon, A Tale. Part 1. Notre Gulliver. Dit le Lord Bolingbroke, Adetel Fable, Voltaire. That Pierre Bonbon was a restaurateur of uncommon qualifications. No man, who during the reign of, frequented the little café in the cul-de-sac Lefebvre at Rouen, will, I imagine, feel himself at liberty to dispute. That Pierre Bonbon was, in an equal degree, skilled in the philosophy of that period, is, I presume, still more especially undeniable. His pâté à la foire were beyond doubt immaculate, but what pen can do justice to his essays sur la nature, his thoughts sur l'homme, his observations sur l'esprit? If his omelettes, if his fricandeau were inestimable, what literature of that day would not have given twice as much for an idée de bonbon? as for all the trash of all the idées of all the rest of the savants. Bonbon had ransacked libraries, which no other man had ransacked, had read more than any other would have entertained a notion of reading, had understood more than any other would have conceived the possibility of understanding, and although, while he flourished, there were not wanting some authors at Rouen to assert that his dicta evinced neither the purity of the academy nor the depth of the lyceum, although, mark me, his doctrines were by no means very generally comprehended. Still, it did not follow that they were difficult of comprehension. It was, I think, on account of their entire self-evidency that many persons were led to consider them abstruse. It is to Bonbon, but let this go no farther, it is to Bonbon that Kant himself is mainly indebted for his metaphysics. The former was not indeed a Platonist, nor strictly speaking an Aristotelian, nor did he, like the modern Leibniz, waste those precious hours which might be employed in the invention of a fricassee, or facile gradu, the analysis of a sensation in frivolous attempts at reconciling the obstinate oils and waters of ethical discussion. Not at all. Bonbon was ionic. Bonbon was equally italic. He reasoned a priori. He reasoned also a posteriori. His ideas were innate or otherwise. He believed in George of Trebizond. He believed in Bossarian. Bonbon was emphatically a bonbonist. I have spoken of the philosopher in his capacity of restaurateur. I would not, however, have any friend of mine imagine that in fulfilling his hereditary duties in that line, our hero wanted a proper estimation of their dignity and importance. Far from it. It was impossible to say in which branch of his duplicate profession he took the greater pride. 
In his opinion, the powers of the mind held intimate connection with the capabilities of the stomach. By this I do not mean to insinuate a charge of gluttony, or indeed any other serious charge to the prejudice of the metaphysician. If Pierre Bonbon had his failings, and what great man has not a thousand? If Pierre Bonbon, I say, had his failings, they were failings of very little importance. Faults indeed, which in other tempers have often been looked upon rather in the light of virtues. As regards one of these foibles, I should not have mentioned it in this history, but for the remarkable prominency, the extreme alto relievo in which it jutted out from the plane of his general disposition. Bonbon could never let slip an opportunity of making a bargain. Not that Bonbon was avaricious. No, it was by no means necessary to the satisfaction of the philosopher that the bargain should be to his own proper advantage. Provided a trade could be effected, a trade of any kind, upon any terms or under any circumstances, a triumphant smile was seen for many days thereafter to enlighten his countenance and a knowing wink of the eye to give evidence of his sagacity. At any epoch it would not be very wonderful if a humour so peculiar as the one I have just mentioned should elicit attention and remark. At the epoch of our narrative, had this peculiarity not attracted observation, there would have been room for wonder indeed. It was soon reported that upon all occasions of the kind, the smile of Bonbon was wont to differ widely from the downright grin with which that restaurateur would laugh at his own jokes or welcome an acquaintance. Hints were thrown out of an exciting nature. Stories were told of perilous bargains made in a hurry and repented of at leisure. And instances were adduced of unaccountable capacities, vague longings, and unnatural inclinations implanted by the author of all evil for wise purposes of his own. The philosopher had other weaknesses, but they are scarcely worthy of our serious examination. For example, there are few men of extraordinary profundity who are found wanting in an inclination for the bottle. Whether this inclination be an exciting cause or rather a valid proof of such profundity, it is impossible to say. Bonbon, as far as I can learn, did not think the subject adapted to minute investigation, nor do I. Yet in the indulgence of a propensity so truly classical, it is not to be supposed that the restaurateur would lose sight of that intuitive discrimination which was wont to characterise, at one and the same time, his essays and his omelettes. With him, Sautern was to Medoc what Catullus was to Homer. He would sport with a syllogism in sipping saint pere but unravel an argument over Clos de Vougeot and upset a theory in a torrent of Chambertin. In his seclusions, the Vin de Bourgogne had its allotted hour, and there were appropriate moments for the Côte de Rhone. Well, had it been if the same quick sense of propriety had attended him in the peddling propensity to which I have formerly alluded, but this was by no means the case. Indeed, to say the truth, that trait of mind in the philosophic bonbon did begin at length to assume a character of strange intensity and mysticism, and however singular it may seem, appeared deeply tinctured with the grotesque Diablerie of his favourite German studies. To enter the little café in the cul-de-sac Lefebvre was, at the period of our tale, to enter the sanctum of a man of genius. Bonbon was a man of genius. There was not a sous cuisiniere in Rouen who could not have told you that Bonbon was a man of genius. His very cat knew it, and forbore to whisk her tail in the presence of the man of genius. His large water-dog was acquainted with the fact, and upon the approach of his master, 
betrayed his sense of inferiority by a sanctity of deportment, a debasement of the ears, and a dropping of the lower jaw not altogether unworthy of a dog. It is, however, true that much of this habitual respect might have been attributed to the personal appearance of the metaphysician. A distinguished exterior will, I am constrained to say, have its weight even with a beast, and I am willing to allow much in the outward man of the restaurateur calculated to impress the imagination of the quadruped. There is a peculiar majesty about the atmosphere of the little grate, if I may be permitted so equivocal an expression, which mere physical bulk alone will be found at all times inefficient in creating. If, however, Bonbon was barely three feet in height, and if his head was diminutively small, still it was impossible to behold the rotundity of his stomach without a sense of magnificence nearly bordering upon the sublime. In its size, both dogs and men must have seen a type of his acquirements, in its immensity, a fitting habitation for his immortal soul. I might here, if it so pleased me, dilate upon the matter of habiliment and other mere circumstances of the external metaphysician. I might hint that the hair of our hero was worn short, combed smoothly over his forehead and surmounted by a conical-shaped white flannel cap and tassels, that his pea-green jerkin was not after the fashion of those worn by the common class of restaurateurs at that day, that the sleeves were something fuller than the reigning costume permitted, that the cuffs were turned up, not as usual in that barbarous period, with cloth of the same quality and colour as the garment, but faced in a more fanciful manner with the party-coloured velvet of Genoa, that his slippers were of a bright purple, curiously filigreed, and might have been manufactured in Japan, but for the exquisite pointing of the toes and the brilliant tints of the binding and embroidery, that his breeches were of the yellow satin-like material called aimable, that his sky-blue cloak, resembling in a form a dressing wrapper, and richly bestudded all over with crimson devices, floated cavalierly upon his shoulders like a mist of the morning, and that his tout ensemble gave rise to the remarkable words of Benevenuta, the improvisatrice of Florence, that it was difficult to say whether Pierre Bonbon was indeed a bird of paradise, or the rather a very paradise of perfection. I have said that to enter the café in the cul-de-sac Lefebvre was to enter the sanctum of a man of genius. But then, it was only the man of genius who could duly estimate the merits of the sanctum. A sign consisting of a vast folio swung before the entrance. On one side of the volume was painted a bottle. On the reverse, a pâté. On the back were visible in large letters the words, Ouvre de Bonbon. Thus was delicately shadowed forth the twofold occupation of the proprietor. Upon stepping over the threshold, the whole interior of the building presented itself to view. A long, low-pitched room of antique construction was indeed all the accommodation afforded by the café in the cul-de-sac Lefebvre. In a corner of the apartment stood the bed of the metaphysician. An array of curtains, together with a canopy à la grecque, gave it an air at once classic and comfortable. In the corner, diagonally opposite, appeared, in direct and friendly communion, the properties of the kitchen and the bibliothèque. A dish of polemics stood peacefully upon the dresser. Here lay an oven full of the latest ethics, there a kettle of duodecimo melange. Volumes of German morality were hand in glove with the gridiron. A toasting fork might be discovered by the side of Eusebius. Plato reclined at his ease in the frying pan, and contemporary manuscripts were filed away upon the spit. End of section 17
Fantasy, Fairies and Ghosts by Various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Bonbon, Part 2. In other respects, the Café de Bonbon might be said to differ little from the cafés of the period. A gigantic fireplace yawned opposite the door. On the right of the fireplace, an open cupboard displayed a formidable array of labelled bottles. There, Mousseau, Chambertin, Saint-Georges, Richebourg, Bordeaux, Margot, Aubryon, Lyonville, Medoc, Sauternes, Barac, Pregnac, Grave, Lafitte, and saint Pere contended with many other names of lesser celebrity for the honour of being quaffed. From the ceiling, suspended by a chain of very long slender links, swung a fantastic iron lamp, throwing a hazy light over the room, and relieving in some measure the placidity of the scene. It was here, about twelve o'clock one night, during the severe winter of, that Pierre Bonbon, after having listened for some time to the comments of his neighbours upon his singular propensity, that Pierre Bonbon, I say, having turned them all out of his house, locked the door upon them with a sacre dieu, and betook himself in no very pacific mood to the comforts of a leather-bottomed armchair and a fire of blazing faggots. It was one of those terrific nights which are only met with once or twice during a century. The snow drifted down bodily in enormous masses, and the Café de Bonbon tottered to its very centre, with the floods of wind that rushing through the crannies in the wall and pouring impetuously down the chimney, shook awfully the curtains of the philosopher's bed and disorganised the economy of his pâté pans and papers. The huge folio sign that swung without, exposed to the fury of the tempest, creaked ominously, and gave out a moaning sound from its stanchions of solid oak. I have said that it was in no very placid temper the metaphysician drew up his chair to its customary station by the hearth. Many circumstances of a perplexing nature had occurred during the day to disturb the serenity of his meditations. In attempting des oeufs à la princesse, he had unfortunately perpetrated an omelette à la reine. The discovery of a principle in ethics had been frustrated by the overturning of a stew, and last, not least, he had been thwarted in one of those admirable bargains which he at all times took such a special delight in bringing to a successful termination. But in the chafing of his mind at these unaccountable vicissitudes, there did not fail to be mingled a degree of that nervous anxiety which the fury of a boisterous night is so well calculated to produce. Whistling to his more immediate vicinity the large black water-dog we have spoken of before, and settling himself uneasily in his chair, he could not help casting a wary and unquiet eye towards those distant recesses of the apartment, whose inexorable shadows not even the red firelight itself could more than partially succeed in overcoming. Having completed a scrutiny, whose exact purpose was perhaps unintelligible to himself, Bonbon drew closer to his seat, a small table covered with books and papers, and soon became absorbed in the task of retouching a voluminous manuscript, intended for publication on the morrow. "'I am in no hurry, Monsieur Bonbon,' whispered a whining voice in the apartment. "'The devil!' ejaculated our hero, starting to his feet, overturning the table at his side, and staring around him in astonishment. "'Very true,' calmly replied the voice. "'Very true? What is very true? How came you here?' vociferated the metaphysician, as his eye fell upon something which lay stretched at full length upon the bed. "'I was saying,' said the intruder, without attending to Bonbon's interrogatories, I was saying that I am not at all pushed for time, 
that the business upon which I took the liberty of calling is of no pressing importance. In short, that I can very well wait until you have finished your exposition. My exposition? There now, how do you know? How came you to understand that I was writing an exposition? Good God! Hush! replied the figure in a shrill undertone, and arising quickly from the bed, he made a single step towards our hero, while the iron lamp overhead swung convulsively back from his approach. The philosopher's amazement did not prevent a narrow scrutiny of the stranger's dress and appearance. The outlines of a figure, exceedingly lean, but much above the common height, were rendered minutely distinct by means of a faded suit of black cloth, which fitted tight to the skin, but was otherwise cut very much in the style of a century ago. These garments had evidently been intended a priori for a much shorter person than their present owner. His ankles and wrists were left naked for several inches. In his shoes, however, a pair of very brilliant buckles gave the lie to the extreme poverty implied by the other portions of his dress. His head was bare and entirely bald, with the exception of the hinder part, from which depended a cue of considerable length. A pair of green spectacles with side glasses protected his eyes from the influence of the light, and at the same time prevented our hero from ascertaining either their colour or their confirmation. About the entire person there was no evidence of a shirt, but a white cravat, of filthy appearance, was tied with extreme precision around the throat, and the ends hanging down formally side by side gave, although I dare say unintentionally, the idea of an ecclesiastic. Indeed, many other points, both in his appearance and demeanour, might have very well sustained a conception of that nature. Over his left ear he carried, after the fashion of a modern clerk, an instrument resembling the stylus of the ancients. In a breast pocket of his coat appeared conspicuously a small black volume fastened with clasps of steel. This book, whether accidentally or not, was so turned outwardly from the person as to discover the words Rituel Catholique in white letters upon the back. His entire physiognomy was interestingly saturnine, even cadaverously pale. The forehead was lofty and deeply furrowed with the ridges of contemplation. The corners of the mouth were drawn down into an expression of the most submissive humility. There was also a clasping of the hands as he stepped towards our hero, a deep sigh, and altogether a look of such utter sanctity as could not have failed to be unequivocally prepossessing. Every shadow of anger faded from the countenance of the metaphysician, as, Having completed a satisfactory survey of his visitor's person, he shook him cordially by the hand and conducted him to a seat. There would, however, be a radical error in attributing this instantaneous transition of feeling in the philosopher to any one of those causes which might naturally be supposed to have had an influence. Indeed, Pierre Bonbon, from what I have been able to understand of his disposition, was of all men the least likely to be imposed upon by any speciousness of exterior deportment. It was impossible that so accurate an observer of men and things should have failed to discover, upon the moment, the real character of the personage who had thus intruded upon his hospitality. To say no more, the confirmation of his visitor's feet was sufficiently remarkable. There was a tremulous swelling in the hinder part of his breeches, and the vibration of his coat-tail was a palpable fact. Judge, then, with what feelings of satisfaction our hero found himself thrown, thus at once into the society of a, 
of a person for whom he had at all times entertained such unqualified respect. He was, however, too much of the diplomatist to let escape him any intimation of his suspicions, or rather, I should say, his certainty in regard to the true state of affairs. It was not his cue to appear at all conscious of the high honour he thus unexpectedly enjoyed, but by leading his guest into conversation, to elicit some important ethical ideas which might, in obtaining a place in his contemplated publication, enlighten the human race, and at the same time immortalise himself, ideas which, I should have added, his visitor's great age and well-known proficiency in the science of morals might very well have enabled him to afford. Actuated by these enlightened views, our hero bade the gentleman sit down, while he himself took occasion to throw some faggots upon the fire, and place upon the now re-established table some bottles of the powerful Vin de Mousseau. Having quickly contemplated these operations, he drew his chair vis-à-vis -vis to his companions, and waited until he should open the conversation. But plans, even the most skilfully matured, are often thwarted in the outset of their application, and the restaurateur found himself entirely nonplussed by the very first words of his visitor's speech. "'I see you know me, Bonbon,' said he. "'Ha, ha, ha! He, he, he! Hi, hi, hi! Ho, ho, ho! Hoo, hoo, hoo! And the devil!' dropping at once the sanctity of his demeanour, opened to its fullest extent a mouth from ear to ear, so as to display a set of jagged and fang-like teeth, and throwing back his head laughed long, loud, wickedly and uproariously, while the black dog crouching down upon his haunches joined lustily in the chorus, and the tabby cat, flying off at a tangent, stood up on end and shrieked in the farthest corner of the apartment. Not so the philosopher. He was too much of a man of the world either to laugh like the dog, or by shrieks to betray the indecorous trepidation of the cat. It must be confessed, however, that he felt a little astonishment to see the white letters which formed the words Rituel Catholique on the book in his guest's pocket, momentarily changing both their colour and their import, and in a few seconds, in place of the original title, the words Regitre de Condam blaze forth in characters of red. This startling circumstance, when Bonbon replied to his visitor's remark, imparted to his manner an air of embarrassment which might not probably have otherwise been observable. Why, sir, said the philosopher, why, sir, to speak sincerely, I believe you are, upon my word, the d dest, that is to say, I think, I imagine, I have some faint, some very faint idea, of the remarkable honour, oh, ah, yes, very well, interrupted his majesty, say no more, I see how it is, and hereupon, Taking off his green spectacles, he wiped the glasses carefully with the sleeve of his coat and deposited them in his pocket. End of section 18 See Fairies and Ghosts by Various This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Bonbon, bon, Part 3 if Bonbon had been astonished at the incident of the book, his amazement was now increased to an intolerable degree by the spectacle which here presented itself to view. In raising his eyes with a strong feeling of curiosity to ascertain the colour of his guests, he found them by no means black as he had anticipated, nor grey as might have been imagined nor yet hazel, nor blue, nor indeed yellow, nor red, nor purple, nor white, nor green, nor any other colour in the heavens above, or in the earth beneath, or in the waters under the earth. 
In short, Pierre Bonbon not only saw plainly that His Majesty had no eyes whatsoever, but could discover no indications of their having existed at any previous period, for the space where eyes should naturally have been was, I am constrained to say, simply a dead level of cadaverous flesh. It was not in the nature of the metaphysician to forbear making some inquiry into the sources of so strange a phenomenon, and to his surprise the reply of His Majesty was at once prompt, dignified, and satisfactory. Eyes, my dear Bonbon, eyes, did you say? Oh, ah, I perceive. The ridiculous prints, eh, which are in circulation, have given you a false idea of my personal appearance. Eyes! True. Eyes, Pierre Bonbon, are very well in their proper place. That, you would say, is the head, right? The head of a worm. To you, likewise, these optics are indispensable. Yet I will convince you that my vision is more penetrating than your own. There is a cat I see in the corner, a pretty cat. Look at her. Observe her well. Now, Bonbon, do you behold the thoughts? The thoughts, I say, the ideas, the reflections, engendering in her pericranium? There it is now. You do not. She is thinking we admire the profundity of her mind. She has just concluded that I am the most distinguished of ecclesiastics, and that you are the most superfluous of metaphysicians. Thus you see, I am not altogether blind, but to one of my profession the eyes you speak of would be merely an encumbrance, liable at any time to be put out by a toasting iron or a pitchfork. To you, I allow, these optics are indispensable. Endeavour, Bonbon, to use them well. My vision is the soul. Hereupon the guest helped himself to the wine upon the table, and pouring out a bumper for Bonbon, requested him to drink it without scruple, and make himself perfectly at home. A clever book that of yours, Pierre, resumed His Majesty, tapping our friend knowingly upon the shoulder, as the latter set down his glass after a thorough compliance with this injunction. A clever book, that of yours, upon my honour. It's a work after my own heart. Your arrangement of matter, I think, however, might be improved, and many of your notions remind me of Aristotle. That philosopher was one of my most intimate acquaintances. I liked him as much for his terrible ill-temper as for his happy knack at making a blunder. There is only one solid truth in all that he has written, and for that I gave him the hint out of pure compassion for his absurdity. I suppose, Pierre Bonbon, you very well know to what divine moral truth I am alluding. Cannot say that I indeed... Why, I told Aristotle, that by sneezing men expelled superfluous ideas through the proboscis. Which is <laughs> undoubtedly the case, said the metaphysician, while he poured out for himself another bumper of Mousseau, and offered his snuff-box to the fingers of his visitor. There was Plato, too, continued His Majesty, modestly declining the snuff-box and the compliment. There was Plato, too, for whom I, at one time, felt all the affection of a friend. You knew Plato, Bonbon? Ah, no, I beg a thousand pardons. He met me at Athens one day in the Parthenon, and told me he was distressed for an idea. I bade him write down that Onu Estin Augus. He said that he would do so, and went home, while I stepped over to the pyramids. But my conscience smote me for the lie, and hastening back to Athens, I arrived behind the philosopher's chair as he was indicting the orgas, giving the gamma a fillip with my finger, I turned it upside down. So the sentence now reads, O nu estin au los, and is, you perceive, the fundamental doctrine of his metaphysics. 
"'Were you ever at Rome?' asked the restaurateur as he finished his second bottle of Mousseau and drew from the closet a larger supply of vin de Chambertin. "'But once, Monsieur Bonbon, but once. There was a time,' said the devil, as if reciting some passage from a book. There was an anarchy of five years, during which the Republic, bereft of all its officers, had no magistracy besides the tribunes of the people, and these were not legally vested with any degree of executive power. At that time, Monsieur Bonbon, at that time only I was in Rome, and I have no earthly acquaintance, consequently, with any of its philosophy. What do you think of Epicurus? What do you think of <gasps> Epicurus? What do I think of whom? What do I think of whom? said the devil in astonishment. You cannot surely mean to find any fault with Epicurus. What do I think of Epicurus? Do you mean me, sir? I am Epicurus. I am the same philosopher who wrote each of the three hundred treatises commemorated by Diogenes, Laertes. That's a lie, said the metaphysician, for the wine had gotten a little into his head. Very well, very well, sir, very well indeed, sir, said his majesty. That's a lie, repeated the restaurateur dogmatically. That's a <laughs> lie. Well, well, have it your own way, said the devil pacifically. And Bonbon, having beaten his majesty at an argument, thought it his duty to conclude a second bottle of Chambertin. As I was saying, resumed the visitor, as I was observing a little while ago, there are some very outre notions in that book of yours, Monsieur Bonbon. What, for instance, do you mean by all that humbug about the soul? Pray, sir, what is the soul? The soul, repeated the metaphysician, referring to his MS, is undoubtedly no, sir. Indubitably, no, sir. Indisputably, no, sir. Evidently, no, sir. Incontrovertibly, no, sir. Heck, no, sir. And beyond all question, a no, sir. The soul is no such thing. Here the philosopher finished his third bottle of Chambertin. Then, heck, pray, sir, what, what is it? That is neither here nor there, Monsieur Bonbon, replied his majesty, musingly. I have tasted, that is to say, I have known some very bad souls, and some two pretty good ones. Here the devil licked his lips, and having unconsciously let fall his hand upon the volume in his pocket, was seized with a violent fit of sneezing. His majesty continued. There was the soul of Cratinus, passable, Aristophanes, racy, Plato, exquisite, not your Plato, but Plato the comic poet, your Plato would have turned the stomach of Severus. Fa! Then let me see, there was Novius, and Andronicus, and Plautus, and Terentius. Then there were Lucilius, and Catullus, and Naso, and Quintius Flaccus. Dear Quinty, as I called him when he sung a secular for my amusement, while I toasted him in pure good humour on a fork. But they want flavour, these Romans. One fat Greek is worth a dozen of them, and besides, we'll keep, which cannot be said of a curite. Let us taste your sauterne. Bonbon had by this time made up his mind to the nil admirari, and endeavoured to hand down the bottles in question. He was, however, conscious of a strange sound in the room, like the wagging of a tail. Of this, although extremely indecent in his majesty, the philosopher took no notice, simply kicking the black water-dog and requesting him to be quiet. The visitor continued. I found that Horace tasted very much like Aristotle. You know I am fond of variety. Terentius I could not have told from Menander, 
nay so to my astonishment was nicanda in disguise virgilius had a strong twang of theocritus marshall put me much in mind of archilochus and titus livy was positively polybius and none other hiccup here replied bonbon and his majesty proceeded but if i have a penchant monsieur bonbon if i have a penchant it is for a philosopher yet let me tell you sir it is not every deaf i mean it is not every gentleman who knows how to choose a philosopher long ones are not good and the best if not carefully shelled are apt to be a little rancid on account of the gall shelled i mean taken out of the carcass what do you think of <laughs> physician don't mention them ugh ugh here his majesty retched violently i never tasted but one that rascal hippocrates smelt of asafoetida ugh ooh, ooh. caught a wretched cold washing him in the sticks and after all he gave me the cholera morbus the hic, wretch ejaculated bonbon the hic, abortion of a pill-box and the philosopher dropped a tear after all continued the visitor after all if a de if a gentleman wishes to live he must have more talents than one or two and with us a fat face is an evidence of diplomacy how so why we are sometimes exceedingly pushed for provisions you must know that in a climate so sultry as mine it is frequently impossible to keep a spirit alive for more than two or three hours and after death unless pickled immediately and a pickled spirit is not good they will smell you understand eh putrefaction is always to be apprehended when the spirits are consigned to us in the usual way <laughs> good god how do you manage here the iron lamp commenced swinging with redoubled violence and the devil half started from his seat however with a slight sigh he recovered his composure merely saying to our hero in a low tone i tell you what pierre bonbon we must have no more swearing bonbon swallowed another bumper and his visitor continued why there are several ways of managing the most of us starve some put up with the pickle for my part i purchase my spirits viventi corpore in which case i find they keep very well but the body the body vociferated the philosopher as he finished a bottle of sauterne the body the body well what of the body oh ah i perceive why sir the body is not at all affected by the transaction i have made innumerable purchases of the kind in my day and the parties never experience any inconvenience there was cain and nimrod and nero and caligula and dionysus and pisistratus and and a thousand others who never knew what it was to have a soul during the latter part of their lives yet sir these men adorned society why isn't there a now whom you know as well as i is he not in possession of all his faculties mental and corporeal who writes a keener epigram who reasons more wittily who but stay i have his agreement in my pocket-book thus saying he produced a red leather wallet and took from it a number of papers upon some of these bonbon caught a glimpse of the letters m a c h i m a z a r i c h and the words caligula and elizabeth his majesty selected a narrow slip of parchment and from it read aloud the following words in consideration of certain mental endowments which it is unnecessary to specify and in farther consideration of one thousand louis d'or i being aged one year and one month 
do hereby make over to the bearer of this agreement or my right title and appurtenance in the shadow called my soul signed a here his majesty repeated a name which i do not feel myself justifiable in indicating more unequivocally a clever fellow that a eh? resumed he but like you monsieur bonbon he was mistaken about the soul the soul a shadow truly no such nonsense monsieur bonbon the soul a shadow ha 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 he 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 who 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 only think of a fricasseed shadow only think <laughs> of a fricasseed shadow echoed our hero whose faculties were becoming gloriously illuminated by the profundity of his majesty's discourse only think of a <laughs> fricasseed shadow now damn <laughs> humph if I would have been such a <laughs> nincompoop, my soul, Mr. Humph. Your soul, Monsieur Bonbon? Yes, sir. <laughs> my soul is what, sir? No shadow, damn. Did not mean to say. Yes, sir. My soul is <laughs> humph. Yes, sir. Did not intend to assert. My soul is <laughs> peculiarly qualified for <laughs> a what sir stew ha souffle a eh? fricasse indeed ragout or fricando and i'll let you have it <laughs> a bargain couldn't think of such a thing said his majesty calmly at the same time arising from his seat the metaphysician stared am supplied at present said his majesty <laughs> eh said the philosopher have no funds on hand what besides very ungentlemanly in me sir to take advantage of <laughs> your present situation here his majesty bowed and withdrew in what manner the philosopher could not precisely ascertain but in a well-concerted effort to discharge a bottle at the villain, the slender chain was severed that depended from the ceiling, and the metaphysician prostrated by the downfall of the lamp. End of section 19 Fantasy Fairies and Ghosts This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra Cullum Fantasy Fairies and Ghosts by Various Section 20 The Child That Went With the Fairies Part 1 Eastward of the old city of Limerick, about ten Irish miles under the range of mountains, known as the Slivelim Hills, famous as having afforded Sarsfield a shelter among their rocks and hollows, when he crossed them in his gallant descent upon the cannon and ammunition of King William, on its way to the beleaguering army, there runs a very old and narrow road. It connects the Limerick Road to Tipperary with the old road from Limerick to Dublin, and runs by bog and pasture, hill and hollow, straw-thatched village and roofless castle, not far from twenty miles. Skirting the healthy mountains of which I have spoken, at one part it becomes singularly lonely. For more than three Irish miles it traverses a deserted country. A wide black bog, level as a lake skirted with copse, spreads at the left. As you journey northward, and the long and irregular line of mountain rises at the right, clothed in heath, broken with lines of grey rock that resemble the bold and irregular outlines of fortifications, and riven with many a gully, expanding here and there into rocky and wooded glens, which open as they approach the road. 
a scanty pasturage on which browsed a few scattered sheep or kine skirts this solitary road for some miles and under shelter of a hillock and of two or three great ash trees stood not many years ago the little thatched cabin of a widow named mary ryan poor was this widow in a land of poverty the thatch had acquired the grey tint and sunken outlines that show how the alternations of rain and sun have told upon that perishable shelter. But whatever other dangers threatened, there was one well provided against by the care of other times. Round the cabin stood half a dozen mountain ashes, as the rowans, inimical to witches, are there called. On the worn planks of the door were nailed two horseshoes, and over the lintel and spreading along the thatch grew luxuriant patches of that ancient cure for many maladies, and prophylactic against the machinations of the evil one. The house leak. Descending into the doorway, in the chiaroscuro of the interior, when your eye grew sufficiently accustomed to that dim light, you might discover hanging at the head of the widow's wooden roofed bed her beads and a vial of holy water here certainly were defences and bulwarks against the intrusion of that unearthly and evil power of whose vicinity this solitary family were constantly reminded by the outline of lisnavora that lonely hill haunt of the good people as the fairies are called euphemistically whose strangely dome-like summit rose not half a mile away, looking like an outwork of the long line of mountain that sweeps by it. It was at the fall of the leaf, and an autumnal sunset threw the lengthening shadow of haunted Lisnavora, close in front of the solitary little cabin, over the undulating slopes and sides of Slieveline. The birds were singing among the branches in the thinning leaves of the melancholy ash trees that grew at the roadside in front of the door. The widow's three younger children were playing on the road, and their voices mingled with the evening song of the birds. Their elder sister, Nell, was within the house, as their phrase is, seeing after the boiling of the potatoes for supper. Their mother had gone down to the bog to carry up a hamper of turf on her back, it is, or was at least, a charitable custom, and if not disused, long may it continue, for the wealthier people when cutting their turf and stacking it in the bog, to make a smaller stack for the behoof of the poor, who were welcome to take from it so long as it lasted. And thus the potato pot was kept boiling, and half warm that would have been cold enough, but for that good-natured bounty through wintry months. Moll Ryan trudged up the steep Boherine, whose banks were overgrown with thorn and brambles, and stooping under her burden re-entered her door, where her dark-haired daughter Nell met her with a welcome, and relieved her of her hamper. Moll Ryan looked round with a sigh of relief, and drying her forehead uttered the monster ejaculation. "'I wish her. It's tired I am with it, God bless it. And where's the crathers, Nell? Playin' out on the road, mother. Didn't you see them and you coming up? No, there was no one before me on the road, she said uneasily. Not a soul, Nell. And why didn't you keep an eye on them? Well, they're in the haggard, playin' there or round by the back of the house. Will I call them in? Do so, good girl, in the name o' God. The hens is coming home, see, and the sun was just down over Nocdoula, and I coming up. So out ran tall, dark-haired Nell, and standing on the road, looked up and down it, but not a sign of her two little brothers, Con and Bill, or her little sister Peg, could she see. She called them, but no answer came from the little haggard, fenced with straggling bushes. She listened, but the sound of their voices was missing. Over the stile and behind the house she ran, but there all was silent and deserted. She looked down toward the bog as far as she could see, but they did not appear. Again she listened, but in vain. At first she had felt angry, but now a different feeling overcame her and she grew pale. 
With an undefined boding, she looked toward the heathy boss of Lisnavora, now darkening into the deepest purple against the flaming sky of sunset. Again she listened with a sinking heart, and heard nothing but the farewell twitter and whistle of the birds in the bushes around. How many stories had she listened to by the winter hearth, of children stolen by the fairies at nightfall, in lonely places? With this fear she knew her mother was haunted. No one in the country round gathered her little flock about her so early as this frightened widow, and no door in the seven parishes was barred so early. Sufficiently fearful as all young people in that part of the world are of such dreaded and subtle agents, Nell was even more than usually afraid of them, for her terrors were infected and redoubled by her mother's. She was looking towards Lisnavora in a trance of fear, and crossed herself again and again and whispered prayer after prayer. She was interrupted by her mother's voice on the road, calling her loudly. She answered and ran round to the front of the cabin, where she found her standing. "'And where in the world's the Crathers? Did you see sight of them anywhere?' cried Mrs. Ryan, as the girl came over the stile. "'Our mother. Tis only what they're run down the road a bit. We'll see them this minute coming back.' It's like goats they are, climbing here and running there, and if I had them here in my hand, maybe I wouldn't give them a hiding all round. May the Lord forgive you, Nell. The childer's gone. They're took, and not a soul near us, and Father Tom three miles away. And what'll I do? Or who's to help us this night? Oh, wish through, wish through, the crathers is gone. Wished, Mother, be easy. Don't you see them coming up? And then she shouted in menacing accents, waving her arm and beckoning the children, who were seen approaching on the road, which some little way off made a slight dip which had concealed them. They were approaching from the westward and from the direction of the dreaded hill of Lisnavora. But there were only two of the children, and one of them, the little girl, was crying. Their mother and sister hurried forward to meet them, more alarmed than ever. "'Where is Billy? Where is he?' cried the mother, nearly breathless, so soon as she was within hearing. "'He's gone. They took him away, but they said he'll come back again,' answered little Con with the dark brown hair. "'He's gone away with the grand ladies,' blubbered the little girl. "'What ladies? Where? Oh, Liam, Mastora, my darling, are you gone away at last? Where is he? Who took him? What ladies are you talking about? What way did he go?' She cried in distraction. "'I couldn't see where he went, mother. Twas like as if he was going to Lisnavora.' With a wild exclamation, the distracted woman ran on towards the hill alone, clapping her hands and crying aloud the name of her lost child. Scared and horrified, Nell, not daring to follow, gazed after her and burst into tears, and the other children raised high their lamentations in shrill rivalry. Twilight was deepening. It was long past the time when they were usually barred securely within their habitation. Nell led the younger children into the cabin and made them sit down by the turf fire, while she stood in the open door, watching in great fear for the return of her mother. After a long while, they did see their mother return. She came in and sat down by the fire and cried as if her heart would break. Will I bar the door, mother? asked Nell. I do. Didn't I lose enough this night without leaving the door open for more of you to go? But first take and sprinkle the dust of the holy waters over you, a quishla, and bring it here till I throw a taste of it over meself and the crathers. And I wonder, Nell, you'd forget to do the like yourself, letting the crathers out so near nightfall. Come here and sit on my knees, Astora. Come to me, Maverneen, and hold me fast in the name of God, and I'll hold you fast that none can take yous from me, and tell me all about it, and what it was the Lord between us and harm, and how it happened and who was in it. 
and the door being barred, the two children sometimes speaking together, often interrupting one another, often interrupted by their mother, managed to tell this strange story, which I had better relate connectedly and in my own language. End of section 20《ファンタジー・フェリーズ・アンド・ゴーストス by various。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。The Child That Went with the Fairies。Part 2。The widow Ryan's three children were playing, as I have said, upon the narrow old road in front of her door. Little Bill, or Liam, about five years old, with golden hair and large blue eyes, was a very pretty boy. With all the clear tints of healthy childhood, and that gaze of earnest simplicity which belongs not to town children of the same age, his little sister Peg, about a year older, and his brother Con, a little more than a year elder than she, made up this little group. Under the great old ash trees, whose last leaves were falling at their feet in the light of an October sunset. They were playing with the hilarity and eagerness of rustic children, clamouring together, and their faces were turned towards the west and storied hill of Lisnavora. Suddenly, a startling voice with a screech called to them from behind, ordering them to get out of the way, and turning, they saw a sight such as they never beheld before. It was a carriage drawn by four horses. That were pawing and snorting in impatience as it just pulled up. The children were almost under their feet and scrambled to the side of the road next their own door. This carriage and all its appointments were old fashioned and gorgeous and presented to the children, who had never seen anything finer than a turf car, and once an old chaise that passed that way from Killaloe, a spectacle perfectly dazzling. Here was antique splendour. The harness and trappings were scarlet and blazing with gold. The horses were huge and snow white, with great manes that, as they tossed and shook them in the air, seemed to stream and float sometimes longer and sometimes shorter like so much smoke. Their tails were long and tied up in bows of broad scarlet and gold ribbon. The coach itself was glowing with colours. Gilded and emblazoned. There were footmen in gay liveries and three cocked hats, like the coachman's, but he had a great wig like a judge's, and their hair was frizzed out and powdered, and a long thick pigtail with a bow to it hung down the back of each. All these servants were diminutive and ludicrously out of proportion with the enormous horses of the equipage, and had sharp, sallow features and small, restless, fiery eyes, and faces of cunning and malice that chilled the children. The little coachman was scowling and showing his white fangs under his cocked hat, and his little blazing beads of eyes were quivering with fury in their sockets as he whirled his whip round and round over their heads till the lash of it looked like a streak of fire in the evening sun and sounded like the cry of a legion of philippuiks in the air. Stop the princess on the highway! cried the coachman in a piercing treble. Stop the princess on the highway! piped each footman in turn, scowling over his shoulder down on the children and grinding his keen teeth. The children were so frightened they could only gape and turn white in their panic. But a very sweet voice from the open window of the carriage reassured them and arrested the attack of the lackeys. A beautiful and very grand looking lady was smiling from it on them. And they all felt pleased in the strange light of that smile. The boy with the golden hair, I think, said the lady, bending her large and wonderfully clear eyes on little Liam. The upper sides of the carriage were chiefly of glass, so that the children could see another woman inside whom they did not like so well. This was a black woman with a wonderfully long neck, hung round with many strings of large, variously coloured beads. And on her head was a sort of turban of silk, striped with all the colours of the rainbow, and fixed in it was a golden star. 
this black woman had a face as thin almost as a death's head, with high cheekbones and great goggle eyes, the whites of which, as well as her wide range of teeth, showed in brilliant contrast with her skin, as she looked over the beautiful lady's shoulder and whispered something in her ear. Yes, the boy with the golden hair, I think, repeated the lady and her voice sounded sweet as a silver bell in the children's ears, and her smile beguiled them like the light of an enchanted lamp, as she leaned from the window with a look of ineffable fondness on the golden-haired boy with the large blue eyes. Insomuch that little Billy, looking up, smiled in return with a wondering fondness. And when she stooped down and stretched her jewelled arms towards him, he stretched his little hands up, and how they touched the other children did not know, but saying, Come and give me a kiss, my darling. She raised him, and he seemed to ascend in her small fingers as lightly as a feather, and she held him in her lap and covered him with kisses. Nothing daunted, the other children would have been only too happy to change places with their favoured little brother. There was only one thing that was unpleasant, and a little frightened them. And that was the black woman, who stood and stretched forward in the carriage as before. She gathered a rich silk and gold handkerchief that was in her fingers up to her lips, and seemed to thrust ever so much of it fold after fold into her capacious mouth, as they thought to smother her laughter with which she seemed convulsed. For she was shaking and quivering, as it seemed, with suppressed merriment, but her eyes, which remained uncovered, looked angrier than they had ever seen eyes look before. But the lady was so beautiful they looked on her instead, and she continued to caress and kiss the little boy on her knee, and smiling at the other children she held up a large russet apple in her fingers, and the carriage began to move slowly on, and with a nod inviting them to take the fruit, she dropped it on the road from the window. It rolled some way beside the wheels, they following, and then she dropped another, and then another, and so on. And the same thing happened to all, for just as either of the children who ran beside had caught the rolling apple, somehow it slipped into a hole or ran into a ditch. And looking up they saw the lady drop another from the window, and so the chase was taken up, and continued till they got hardly knowing how far they had gone, to the old crossroads that leads to Owney. It seemed that there the horses' hooves and carriage wheels rolled up a wonderful dust, which being caught in one of those eddies that whirl the dust up into a column on the calmest day, enveloped the children for a moment, and passed whirling on towards Lisnavora. The carriage, as they fancied, driving in the centre of it, but suddenly it subsided. The straws and leaves floated to the ground, the dust dissipated itself, but the white horses and the lackeys, the gilded carriage, the lady and their little golden-haired brother, were gone. At the same moment, suddenly the upper rim of the clear-setting sun disappeared behind the hill of Nokdula, and it was twilight. Each child felt the transition like a shock, and the sight of the rounded summit of Lisnavora, now closely overhanging them, struck them with a new fear. They screamed their brother's name after him, but their cries were lost in the vacant air. At the same time they thought they heard a hollow voice say close to them, Go home. Looking round and seeing no one, they were scared, and hand in hand the little girl crying wildly, and the boy white as ashes from fear, they trotted homeward at their best speed to tell, as we have seen, their strange story. Molly Ryan never more saw her darling, but something of the lost little boy was seen by his former playmates. Sometimes when their mother was away earning a trifle at haymaking and Nellie washing the potatoes for their dinner, or beetling clothes in the little stream that flows in the hollow close by, they saw the pretty face of little Billy, peeping in archly at the door and smiling silently at them. And as they ran to embrace him with cries of delight, 
he drew back, still smiling archly, and when they got out into the open day, he was gone, and they could see no trace of him anywhere. This happened often with slight variations in the circumstances of the visit. Sometimes he would peep for a longer time, sometimes for a shorter time. Sometimes his little hand would come in, and with bended finger beckon them to follow but always he was smiling with the same arch look and wary silence, and always he was gone when they reached the door. Gradually these visits grew less and less frequent, and in about eight months they ceased altogether, and little Billy, irretrievably lost, took rank in their memories with the dead. One wintry morning nearly a year and a half after his disappearance, their mother having set out for Limerick soon after cockcrow to sell some fowls at the market, the little girl, lying by the side of her elder sister who was fast asleep, just at the grey of the morning heard the latch lifted softly, and saw little Billy enter and close the door gently after him. There was light enough to see that he was barefoot and ragged, and looked pale and famished. He went straight to the fire and cowered over the turf embers, and rubbed his hands slowly, and seemed to shiver as he gathered the smouldering turf together. The little girl clutched her sister in terror and whispered, Waken Nellie, waken, here's Billy come back. Nellie slept soundly on, but the little boy, whose hands were extended close over the coals, turned and looked toward the bed, it seemed to her in fear and she saw the glare of the embers reflected on his thin cheek as he turned toward her. He rose and went on tiptoe quickly to the door in silence, and let himself out as softly as he had come in. After that the little boy was never seen any more by any one of his kindred. Fairy doctors as the dealers in the preternatural, who in such cases were called in, are termed, did all that in them lay, but in vain. Father Tom came down and tried what holier rites could do, but equally without result. So little Billy was dead to mother, brother and sisters, but no grave received him. Others whom affection cherished lay in holy ground, in the old churchyard of Abington, with headstone to mark the spot over which the survivor might kneel and say a kind prayer for the peace of the departed soul. But there was no landmark to show where little Billy was hidden from their loving eyes, unless it was in the old hill of Lisnavora, that cast its long shadow at sunset before the cabin door, or that, white and filmy in the moonlight in later years, would occupy his brother's gaze as he returned from fair or market and draw from him a sigh and a prayer for the little brother he had lost so long ago and was never to see again. End of section 21please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra Cullen Fantasy Fairies and Ghosts by Various Section 22 Madam Crowell's Ghost, Part 1 Twenty years have passed since you last saw Mrs. Jolliffe's tall, slim figure. She is now past seventy, and can't have many milestones more to count on the journey that will bring her to her long home. The hair has grown white as snow, that is parted under her cap over her shrewd but kindly face. But her figure is still straight, and her step light and active. She has taken of late years to the care of adult invalids, having surrendered to younger hands the little people who inhabit cradles and crawl on all fours, those who remember that good-natured face among the earliest that emerge from the darkness of nonentity, and who owe to their first lessons in the accomplishment of walking and a delighted appreciation of their first babblings and earliest teeth, have spired up into tall lads and lasses now. 
some of them shoe streaks of white by this time in brown locks, the bonny gooden hair that she was so proud to brush and shoe to admiring mothers, who are seen no more on the green of golden friars, and whose names are traced now on the flat grey stones in the churchyard. So the time is ripening some and searing others, and the saddening and tender sunset hour has come, and it is evening with the kind old north country dame who nursed pretty laura mildmay who now stepping into the room smiles so gladly and throws her arms round the old woman's neck and kisses her twice now this is so lucky said mrs jenner you have just come in time to hear a story really that's delightful na na odd wit no story or true for that I sit it with my ain iron. Ghosts, the very thing of all others I should most likely to hear of. Well, dear, said Mrs. Jenner, if you are not afraid, sit you down here with us. She was just going to tell me all about her first engagement to attend a dying old woman, says Mrs. Jenner, and of the ghost she saw there. Now, Mrs. Jolliffe, make your tea first, and then begin. The good woman obeyed, and having prepared a cup of that companionable nectar, she sipped a little, drew her brows slightly together to collect her thoughts, and then looked up with a wondrous solemn face to begin. Good Mrs. Jenner and the pretty girl, each gazed with eyes of solemn expectation in the face of the old woman, who seemed to gather awe from the recollections she was summoning. The old room was a good scene for such a narrative, with the oak wainscoting, quaint and clumsy furniture, the heavy beams that crossed its ceiling, and the tall four-post bed with dark curtains, within which you might imagine what shadows you please. Mrs. Jolliffe cleared her voice, rolled her eyes slowly round, and began her tale in these words. Madam Crowell's Ghost I'm an old woman now, and I was but thirteen my last birthday, the night I came to Applewale House. My aunt was the housekeeper there, and a sort of one-horse carriage was down at Lexo, waiting to take me and my box up to Applewale. I was a bit frightened by the time I got to Lexo, and when I saw the carriage and horse, I wished myself back again with my mother at Hazeldon. I was crying when I got into the shay, that's what we used to call it, an old John Mulberry that drove it, and was a good-natured fellow, bought me a handful of apples at the Golden Lion to cheer me up a bit, and he told me that there was a currant cake and tea and pork chops waiting for me, all hot, in my aunt's room at the great house. It was a fine moonlight night, and I ate the apples looking out of the shay window. It's a shame for gentlemen to frighten a poor foolish child like I was. I sometimes think it might be tricks. There was two on em on the tap of the coach beside me, and they began to question me after nightfall, when the moon rose, where I was going to. Well, I told them it was to wait on Dame Arabella Crowell of Applewale House, near by Lexho. Ho, then, says one of them, you'll not be long there. And I looked at him as much as to say, why not? for I had spoken out when I told them where I was going, as if twas something clever I had to say. Because, says he, and don't you for your life tell no one, only watch her and see, she's possessed by the devil, and more than half a ghost. Have you got a Bible? Yes, sir, says I, for my mother put my little Bible in my box, and I knew it was there, and by the same token, though the print's too small for my old eyes, I have it in my press to this hour. As I looked up at him, saying, Yes, sir, I thought I saw him winking at his friend, but I could not be sure. Well, says he, be sure you put it under your bolster every night. It will keep the old girl's claws off you. And I got such a fright when he said that you wouldn't fancy and I'd a like to ask him a lot about the old lady, but I was too shy, and he and his friend began talking together about their own concerns, and dowly enough I got down, as I told you, at Lexho. My heart sank as I drove into the dark avenue. The trees stand very thick and big, as old as the old house almost, and four people with their arms out and fingertips touching barely girds round some of them. 
Well, my neck was stretched out of the window, looking for the first view of the great house, and all at once we pulled up in front of it. A great white and black house it is, with great black beams across and right up it, and gables looking out as white as a sheet to the moon, and the shadows of the trees, two or three up and down in front. You could count the leaves on them, and all the little diamond-shaped window panes, glimmering on the great old window, and great shutters in the old fashion, inged on the wall outside, bolted across all the rest of the windows in front, for there was but three or four servants, and the old lady in the house, and most at rooms was locked up. My heart was in my mouth when I said the journey was over, and this the great house afore me, and I sat near my aunt, and I never said till noon, and Dame Crowell that I was to come and wait upon, and was a feared on already. My aunt kissed me in the hall and brought me to her room. She was tall and thin with her pale face and black eyes, and long thin hands with black mittens on. She was past fifty and her word was short, but her word was law. I have no complaints to make of her, but she was a hard woman, and I think she would have been kinder to me if I had been her sister's child in place of her brother's, but all that's a no consequence new. The squire, his name was Mr. Shevenix Crowell, he was Dame Crowell's grandson, came down there by way of seeing that the old lady was well treated, about twice or thrice in the year. I sit in but twice all the time I was at Applewell House. I can't say but she was well taken care of, notwithstanding, but that was because my aunt and Meg Wyvern, that was her maid, had a conscience and did their duty by her. Mrs. Wyvern, Meg Wyvern, my aunt called her to herself, and Mrs. Wyvern to me, was a fat, jolly lass of fifty, a good height and a good breadth, always good-humoured and walked slow. She had fine wages, but she was a bit stingy, and kept all her fine clothes under lock and key, and wore mostly a twilled chocolate cotton with red and yellow, and green sprigs and balls on it, and it lasted wonderful. She never gave me nout, not the valley or a brass thimble, all the time I was there, but she was good-humoured and always laughing, and she talked no end of proas over her tea. And seeing me so sackless and dowly, she roused me up with her laughing and stories, and I think I liked her better than my aunt. Children is so taken with a bit of fun or a story, though my aunt was very good to me, but a hard woman about some things, and silent always. My aunt took me into her bedchamber that I might rest myself a bit while she was setting the tea in her room, but first she patted me on the shoulder and said I was a tall lass of my years and had spied up well, and asked me if I could do plain work and stitching, and she looked in my face and said I was like my father, her brother that was dead and gone, and she hoped I was a better Christian, a wouldna do her their lids, would not do anything of that sort. It was a hard saying the first time I set foot in her room, I thought. When I went into the next room, the housekeeper's room, very comfortable, yak, oak all round. There was a fine fire blazing away with coal and peat and wood, all in a low together, and tea on the table and hot cake and smoking meat. And there was Mrs. Wyvern, fat, jolly and talking away, more in an hour than my aunt would in a year. While I was still at my tea, my aunt went upstairs to see Madame Crowell. She's a-gone up to see that old Judith Squales is awake, says Mrs. Wyvern. Judith sits with Madame Crowell when me and Mrs. Shutters, that was my aunt's name, is away. She's a troublesome old lady. You'll have to be sharp with her, or she'll be into the fire and out at winder. She goes on wire, she does, old though she be. How old, ma'am, says I. Ninety-three her last birthday, and that's eight months gone, says she, and she laughed. And don't be asking questions about her before your aunt mind. I tell ye, just take her as you find her, and that's all. And what's to be my business about her, please, ma'am, says I. About the old lady? Well, says she, your aunt, Mrs. Shutters, will tell you that. But I suppose you'll have to sit in the room with your work and see she's at no mischief. And let her amuse herself with her things on the table. And get her her food or drink as she calls for it and keep her out of mischief and ring the bell hard if she's troublesome. Is she deaf, ma'am? No, nor blind, says she, 
as sharp as a needle, but she's gone quite orpy and can't remember now rightly, and Jack the Giant Killer or Goody Two-Shoes will please her as well as the King's Court or the affairs of the nation. And what did the little girl go away for, ma'am, that went on Friday last? My aunt wrote to my mother she was to go. Yes, she's gone. What for, says I again? She didn't answer Mrs. Shutters, I do suppose, says she. I don't know. Don't be talking. Your aunt can't abide a talking child. And please, ma'am, is the old lady well in health, says I. It ain't no arm to ask that, says she. She's torfling a bit lately, but better this week past, and I dare say she'll last out a hundred years yet. Hish, here's your aunt coming down the passage. In comes my aunt and begins talking to Mrs. Wyvern, and I, beginning to feel more comfortable and at home like, was walking about the room looking at this thing and at that. There was pretty old china things on the cupboard and pictures again the wall and there was a door open in the wainscot, and I seen a queer old leathern jacket with straps and buckles to it, and sleeves as long as the bedpost hanging up inside. End of section 22《A Fantasy Fairies and Ghosts by Various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Madame Crowell's Ghost Part two. What's that you're at, child? says my aunt, sharp enough, turning about when I thought she least minded. What's that in your hand? This, ma'am, says I, turning about with the leathern jacket. I don't know what it is, ma'am. Pale as she was, the red came up in her cheeks, and her eyes flashed with anger, and I think only she had half a dozen steps to take between her and me. She'd a give me a scissor. But she did give me a shake by the shoulder, and she plucked the thing out of my hand and says she, While ever you stay here, don't ye meddle with nout that don't belong to ye. And she hung it up on the pin that was there, and shut the door with a bang and locked it fast. Mrs. Wyvern was lifting up her hands and laughing all this time, quietly in her chair, rolling herself a bit in it as she used when she was kinking. The tears was in my eyes and she winked at my aunt, and says she, drying her own eyes that were wet with the laughing. Tut, the child meant no harm. Come here to me, child. It's only a pair of crutches for lame ducks, and ask us no questions, mind, and we'll tell you no lies. And come here and sit down and drink a mug of beer before you go to your bed. My room, mind ye, was upstairs next to the old lady's, and Mrs. Wyvern's bed was near hers in her room, and I was to be ready at call, if need should be. The old lady was in one of her tantrums that night and part of the day before. She used to take fits of the sulks. Sometimes she would not let them dress her, and at other times she would not let them take her clothes off. She was a great beauty, they said, in her day. There was no one about Applewale that remembered her in her prime. And she was dreadful fond of dress, and had thick silks and stiff satins and velvets and laces and all sorts enough to set up seven shops at the least. All her dresses was old-fashioned and queer, but worth a fortune. Well, I went to my bed. I lay for a while awake, for a things was new to me, and I think the tea was in my nerves too, for I wasn't used to it, except now and then on a holiday or the like. And I heard Mrs. Wyvern talking, and I listened with my hand to my ear, but I could not hear Mrs. Crowell, and I don't think she said a word. There was great care took of her. The people at Applewell knew that when she died they would every one get the sack and their situations was well paid and easy. The doctor came twice a week to see the old lady and you may be sure they all did as he bid them. One thing was the same every time. They were never to cross or frump her any way but to humour and please her in everything. So she lay in her clothes all that night and next day, not a word, she said, and I was at my needlework all that day in my own room, except when I went down to my dinner. I would have liked to see the old lady and even to hear her speak, but she might as well have been in London at the time for me. When I had my dinner, my aunt sent me out for a walk for an hour. I was glad when I came back. The trees were so big and the place so dark and lonesome 
and twas a cloudy day, and I cried a deal thinking of home while I was walking alone there. That evening the candles being alight, I was sitting in my room and the door was open into Madame Crow's chamber, where my aunt was. It was then for the first time I heard what I supposed was the old lady talking. It was a queer noise like, I couldn't well say which. A bird or a beast only had a bleating sound in it and was very small. I pricked my ears to hear all I could, but I could not make out one word she said, and my aunt answered. The evil one can't hurt no one, ma'am, bout the Lord permits. Then the same queer voice from the bed says something more that I couldn't make head nor tail on. And my aunt made answer again. Let them pull faces, ma'am, and say what they will. If the Lord be for us, who can be against us? I kept listening with my ear turned to the door, old in my breath, but not another word or sound came in from the room. In about twenty minutes, as I was sitting by the table looking at the pictures in the old Aesop's fables, I was aware of something moving at the door, and looking up I see my aunt's face looking in at the door, and her hand raised. Hish, says she, very soft, and comes over to me on tiptoe, and she says in a whisper, Thank God she's asleep at last, and don't you make no noise till I come back, for I'm going down to take my cup of tea, and I'll be back in new, me and Mrs. Wyvern, and she'll be sleeping in the room, and you can run down when we come up. And Judith will gee you supper in my room. And with that she goes. I kept looking at the picture book as before, listening every now and then, but there was no sound, not a breath that I could hear. And I began whispering to the pictures and talking to myself to keep my heart up, for I was growing feared in that big room. And at last I got up and began walking about the room, looking at this and peeping at that, to amuse my mind, you'll understand. And at last, what should I do but peeps into Madame Crowell's bedchamber? A grand chamber it was, with a great four-poster bed, with flowered silk curtains as tall as the ceiling, and folding down on the floor, and drawn close all round. There was a looking-glass, the biggest I ever said before, and the room was a blaze of light. I counted twenty-two wax candles all alight. Such was her fancy, and no one dared say her nay. I listened at the door and gaped and wondered all round. When I heard there was not a breath and did not see so much as a stir in the curtains, I took heart and walked into the room on tiptoe and looked round again. Then I takes a keek at myself in the big glass, and at last it came in my head. Why couldn't I had a keek at the old lady herself in the bed? You'd think me a fool if you knew half how I longed to see Dame Crowell, and I thought to myself if I didn't peep now, I might wait many a day before I got so good a chance again. Well, my dear, I came to the side of the bed, the curtains being close, and my heart almost failed me, but I took courage and I slips my fingers in between the thick curtains, and there my hand. So I waits a bit, but all was still as death. So softly, softly I draws the curtain, and there, sure enough, I sit before me, stretched out like the painted lady on the tombstone in Lexo Church, the famous Dame Crowell of Applewale House. There she was, dressed out. You never see the like in they days. Satin and silk and scarlet and green, and gold and pint lace, by Jen was a sight. A big powdered wig half as high as herself was the top of her head, and wow, was ever such wrinkles, and her old baggy throat all powdered white, and her cheeks rouged and mouse skin eyebrows that Mrs. Wyvern used to stick on, and there she lay, proud and stark. Wear a pair of clocked silk hose on and heels to her shoon as tall as nine pins. Lork, but her nose was crooked and thin, and half the whites of her eyes was open. She used to stand dressed as she was, giggling and dribbling before the looking glass, wear a fan in her hand and a big nosegay in her bodice. 
her wrinkled little hands were stretched down by her sides and such long nails all cut into points i never sid in my days could it even have been a fashion for grit folk to wear their fingernails so well i think ye'd have been frightened yourself if you'd have seen such a sight i couldn't let go the curtain nor move an inch nor take my eyes off her my very heart stood still and in an instant she opens her eyes and up she sits and spins herself round and down with her with a clack on her two tall heels on the floor facing me ogling in my face where two great glassy eyes and a wicked simper where wrinkled lips and long faust teeth well a corpse is a natural thing but this was the dreadfulest sight i ever said she had her finger straight out pointing at me and her back was crooked round again we age says she ye little limb what did ye say i killed the boy i'll tickle ye till you're stiff if i'd a thought an instant i'd a turned about and run but i couldn't take my eyes off her and i backed from her as soon as i could and she came clattering after like a thing on wires with her fingers pointing to my throat and she making all the time a sound with her tongue like zzz, zzz, zzz. i kept backing and backing as quick as i could and her fingers was only a few inches away from my throat and i felt i'd lose my wits if she touched me I went back this way right into the corner and I gave a yellock. You'd think soul and body was parting and that minute my aunt from the door calls out we are Blair and the old lady turns round on her and I turns about and ran through my room and down the stairs as hard as my legs could carry me. I cried hearty, I can tell you, when I got down to the housekeeper's room. Mrs. Wyvern laughed a deal when I told her what happened but she changed her key when she heard the old lady's words. Say them again, says she. So I told her. You little limb, what for did you say I killed the boy? I'll tickle ye till you're stiff. And did ye say she killed a boy, says she? Not I, ma'am, says I. Judith was always up with me after that, when the two elder women was away from her. I would have jumped out at window rather than stay alone in the same room with her. It was about a week after, as well as I can remember, Mrs. Wyvern one day when me and her was alone, told me a thing about Madame Crowell that I did not know before. She being young and a great beauty, full seventy year before, had married Squire Crowell of Applewell, but he was a widower and had a son about nine years old. There never was tale or tidings of this boy after one morning. No one could say where he went to. He was allowed too much liberty, and used to be off in the morning one day to the keeper's cottage and breakfast with him, and away to the warren and not home, mayhap till evening, and another time down to the lake and bathe there and spend the day fishing there, or paddling about in the boat. Well, no one could say what was gone with him, only this— that his hat was found by the lake under a hawthorn that grows there to this day, and twas thought he was drowned bathing. And the squire's son, by his second marriage with this Madame Crowell that lived so dreadful long, came in for the estates. It was his son, the old lady's grandson, Squire Chevenick's Crowell, that owned the estates at the time I came to Applewell. There was a deal of talk long before my aunt's time about it, and twas said the stepmother knew more than she was like to let out, and she managed her husband, the old squire, with her white heft and flatteries, and as the boy was never seen more, in course of time the thing died out of folks' minds. I'm going to tell you new about what I said with my own iron. End of section 23Four Fantasy Fairies and Ghosts by Various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Madame Crowell's Ghost, Part Three. I was not there six months, and it was winter time when the old lady took her last sickness. The doctor was afeard she might have took a fit of madness, as she did fifteen years before, and was buckled up many a time in a straight waistcoat, which was the very leathern jerkin I sit in the closet off my aunt's room. Well, she didn't. 
She pined and windered and went off torflin, torflin, quiet enough, till a day or two before her flitting, and then she took to rambling and sometimes skirling in the bed. You'd think a robber had a knife to her throat, and she used to work out of the bed, and not being strong enough then to walk or stand, she'd fall on the floor with her old wizen hand stretched before her face, and skirling still for mercy. Ye may guess I didn't go into the room, and I used to be shivering in my bed with fear at her skirling and scraffling on the floor, and blaring out words that'd make your skin turn blue. My aunt and Mrs. Wyvern and Judith Squales, and a woman from Lexo, was always about her. At last she took fits and they wore her out. Tea, sir, was there and prayed for her, but she was past praying with. I suppose it was right, but none could think there was much good in it. And sat at long last she made her flitting and was over. And old Dame Crowell was shrouded and coffined, and Squire Chevenix was roped for. But he was away in France, and the delay was so long that to Sir and Doctor both agreed it would not do to keep her longer out of her place, and no one cared but just them two, and my aunt and the rest of us from Applewell to go to the burying. So the old lady of Applewell was laid in the vault under Lexo Church, and we lived up at the great house till such time as the squire should come to tell his will about us, and pay off such as he chose to discharge. I was put into another room two doors away from what was Dame Crowell's chamber after her death, and this thing happened the night before Squire Chevenix came to Applevale. The room I was in now was a large square chamber covered with yak panels, but unfurnished except for my bed, which had no curtains to it, and a chair and a table or so that looked nothing at all in such a big room and the big looking-glass that the old lady used to keek into and admire herself from head to heel. Now that there was no mare of that work, was put out of the way and stood against the wall in my room, for there was shifting of many things in her chamber, you may suppose, when she came to be coffined. The news had come that day that the squire was to be down next morning at Applewale, and not sorry was I, for I thought I was sure to be sent home again to my mother. And right glad was I, and I was thinking of her at home, and my sister Janet, and the kitten, and the pig mag, and Trimmer the tyke, and all the rest. And I got so fidgety I couldn't sleep, and the clock struck twelve and me wide awake, and the room as dark as pick. My back was turned to the door and my eyes toward the wall opposite. Well, it could na be a full quarter past twelve, when I sees a lightning on the wall before me, as if something took fire behind, and the shadows of the bed, and the chair, and my gown that was hanging from the wall, was dancing up and down on the ceiling beams and the yak panels, and I turns my head o'er my shoulder quick, thinking something must have gone afire. And what should I see by Jen? But the likeness of the old bell dame, bedizened out in her satins and velvets on her dead body, simpering, with her eyes as wide as saucers and her face like the fiend himself. T'was a red light that rose about her in a fuffing low, as if her dress round her feet was blazing. She was driving on right for me, with her old shrivel hands crooked as if she was going to claw me. I could not stir, but she passed me straight by, where blast a cold air and I sit her at the wall in the alcove, as my aunt used to call it, which was a recess where the state bed used to stand in old times where a door open wide, and her hands groping in at something was there. I never sit that door before, and she turned round to me like a thing on a pivot, flyering, and all at once the room was dark and I standing at the far side of the bed. I don't know how I got there, and I found my tongue at last, and if I didn't a blare a yellick, running down the gallery and almost pulled Mrs. Wyvern's door off to hooks, and frighted her half out of wits. You may guess I didn't sleep that night, and with the first light down with me to my aunt as fast as my two legs could carry me. Well, my aunt didn't a frump or flight me as I thought she would, but she held me by the hand and looked hard in my face all the time, and she told me not to be feared, and says she, 
at the appearance a key in its hand. Yes, says I, bringing it to mind, a big key in a queer brass handle. Stop a bit, says she, letting go my hand, and opening the cupboard door. Was it like this, says she, taking one out in her fingers, and showing it to me with a dark look in my face? That was it, says I, quick enough. Are you sure, she says, turning it around. Sart, says I, and I felt like I was going to faint when I said it. Well, that will do, child, says she, softly thinking, and she locked it up again. The squire himself will be here today before twelve o'clock, and you must tell him all about it, says she, thinking, and I suppose I'll be leaving soon. And so the best thing for the present is that you should go home this afternoon and I'll look out another place for you when I can. Fain was I, ye may guess, at that word. My aunt packed up my things for me and the three pounds that was due to me to bring home, and Squire Crowell himself came down to Applewell that day, a handsome man about thirty years old. It was the second time I sid him, but this was the first time he spoke to me. My aunt talked with him in the housekeeper's room, and I don't know what they said. I was a bit feared on the squire, he being a great gentleman down in Lexo, and I don't go near till I was called. And says he, smiling, What's a this you send, child? It mun be a dream, for you know there's na sick a thing as a boar or freet in all the world. But whatever it was, my little maid, sit ye down and tell all about it from first to last. Well, so soon as I made an end, he thought a bit, and says he to my aunt, I mind the place well. In old Sir Oliver's time, lame Wendell told me there was a door in that recess to the left, where the lassie dreamed she saw my grandmother open it. He was past eighty when he told me that, and I but a boy. The plate and jewels used to be kept there long ago, before the iron closet was made in the arras chamber, and he told me the key had a brass handle. And this, you say, was found in the bottom of the kist where she kept her old fans. Now, would not it be a queer thing if we found some spoons or diamonds forgot there? You mun come up wi' us, lassie, and point to the very spot. Loath was I and my heart in my mouth, and fast I held my aunt's hand as I stepped into that awesome room, and showed them both how she came and passed me by, and the spot where she stood and where the door seemed to open. There was an old empty press against the wall then, and shoving it aside, sure enough, there was the tracing of a door in the wainscot, and a keyhole stopped with wood, and planed across as smooth as the rest, and the joining of the door all stopped with putty the colour of yak. And, but for the hinges that showed a bit when the press was shoved aside, you would not consent there was a door there at all. Ha, says he with a queer smile, this looks like it. It took some minutes with a small chisel and hammer to pick the bit of wood out of the keyhole. The key fitted, sure enough, and with a strang twist and a long screak, the bolt went back and he pulled the door open. There was another door inside, stranger than the first, but the lax was gone and it opened easy. Inside was a narrow floor and walls and vault a brick. We could not see what was in it, for twas dark as pick. When my aunt had lighted the candle, the squire held it up and stepped in. My aunt stood on tiptoe, trying to look over his shoulder, and I didn't see note. Ha ha, says the squire, stepping backward. What's that? Gimme the poker quick, says he to my aunt. And as she went to the hearth, I peeps beside his arm, and I said, Squat down in the far corner, a monkey or a flaying on the chest, or else the may shriveled up, wizened old wife that ever was seen on earth. By Jen, says my aunt, as putting the poker in his hand. She keeked by his shoulder and said the ill-favoured thing, Ha, care, sir, what you're doing. Back we ye and shut to the door. But in place of that he steps in saffly with the poke appointed like a sword, and he gives it a poke, and down it all tumbles together. Hair and a, in a heap of bayons and dust, little mayor and a hatful. Twas the bayons or a child, 
ay, the rest went to dust at a touch. They said nout for a while, but he turns round the skull as it lay on the floor. Young as I was, I consated I knew well enough what they were thinking on. A dead cat, says he, pushing back and blowing out the candle and shut into the door. We'll come back, you and me, Mrs. Shutters, and look on the shelves by and by. I've other matters first to speak to ye about. And this little girl's going home, you say. She has her wages, and I mun make her a present, says he, patting my shoulder with his hand. And he did give me a goad pound, and I went off to Lexo about an hour after, and sa home by the stage coach. And fain was I to be at home again, and I never said Dame Crowl or Apple Whale, God be thanked, either in appearance or in dream at Hefter. But when I was grown to be a woman, my aunt spent a day and night with me at Littleham, and she told me there was no doubt it was the poor little boy that was missing Sir Lang Sen, that was shut up to die there in the dark by that wicked bell dame. Where his skirls or his prayers or his thumping could not be heard, and his hat was left by the water's edge. Whoever did it, to make belief he was drowned. The clothes at the first touch a ran into a snuff of dust in the cell where the bions was found, but there was a handful of jet buttons and a knife with a green heft. Together were a couple of pennies the poor little fella had in his pocket, I suppose, when he was decoyed in there and sid his last of the light. And there was among the squire's papers a copy of the notice that was printed after he was lost, when the old squire thought he might have run away or been took by gypsies and it said he had a green hefted knife with him, and that his buttons were a cut jet. Sa that is, I have to say, concerning old Dame Crowl or Apple Whale House. End of section 24 Of Fantasy, Fairies and Ghosts This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra Cullum Fantasy, Fairies and Ghosts by Various Section 25 Queen Mab A little fairy comes at night, her eyes are blue, her hair is brown. With silver spots upon her wings and from the moon she flutters down. She has a little silver wand, and when a good child goes to bed, she waves her wand from right to left, and makes a circle round its head. And then it dreams of pleasant things, of fountains filled with fairy fish, and trees that bear delicious fruit, and bow their branches at a wish. Of arbours filled with dainty scents from lovely flowers that never fade, bright flies that glitter in the sun, and glow-worms shining in the shade and talking birds with gifted tongues for singing songs and telling tales, and pretty dwarfs to show the way through fairy hills and fairy dales. But when a bad child goes to bed, from left to right she weaves her rings, and then it dreams all through the night of only ugly, horrid things. Then lions come with glaring eyes, and tigers growl a dreadful noise, and ogres draw their cruel knives to shed the blood of girls and boys. Then stormy waves rush on to drown, or raging flames come scorching round. Fierce dragons hover in the air, and serpents crawl along the ground. Then wicked children wake and weep, and wish the long black gloom away, but good ones love the dark and find the night as pleasant as the day. End of Fantasy, Fairies and Ghosts by Various